Good morning, everyone. My name is James Langer. I'm the digital content manager for Channel3000.com. We are getting ready for day five of the Chandler Halderson homicide trial. Uh, the jury has just entered the courtroom, so we will take you there live right now. And uh, if there's anything you need in that regards, please let Randy know. Um, we do have a fan that he set up to try and get a little more direct circulation for you. Before we begin uh, with the resumption of the, case, of the state's case in chief, is there anyone in the panel who was exposed to any information over the weekend, unintentionally or intentionally sought out any uh, further information about this case or participated in or overheard discussions about the evidence, the case, the parties, the witnesses, etc.? I see no hands. Thanks very much. Uh, let's begin. Attorney Brown. The state will call Jessamay Torres. Good morning. I would ask if you believe you can do so safely and responsibly if you could testify without a mask this morning. Is that all right with you? Yes, that is. Go ahead and remove your mask then, please. Thank you. Go right ahead. Good morning. Please state and spell your name for us. Good morning. My name is Jessamy Torres, spelled J-E-S-S-A-M-Y. Torres is T-O-R-R-E-S. And uh, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm a lieutenant with the Dane County Sheriff's Office. Uh, could you tell us what the role of a lieutenant is, uh, in, perhaps in contrast to we've already heard from maybe some deputies and some detectives? What is a lieutenant? So a lieutenant is a supervisor um, over the deputies, detectives, sergeants. Um, and in my opinion, my role as a supervisor is to assist the people that are doing the job, help them in any way that I can uh, to do the best job that they can under those circumstances. In early July of last year, <clears throat> were you asked to, to kind of perform in that role uh, as a lieutenant uh, regarding uh, a few days of a search of the Irwin Road property uh, here in Dane County? Yes, it was. And was that in relation to the homicides of Bart and Krista Halderson? Yes. Okay. Uh, what was your role as, as one of these people out there who is maybe higher ranking? What was your role on the property? Well, so I was out there two different days, um, and my role was just kind of to be the overall um, supervisor of the scene. Uh, both days that I was uh, present at the Irwin Road property, um, I primarily interacted with the property owners. Um, they were very uh, distraught and emotional. Um, so I spent a lot of mo the majority of my time talking with them and trying to keep them calm so that the detectives and the deputies on scene could do their jobs. So while we're going to hear probably a lot today from people who found things on the property, you weren't one of those people out <clears throat> physically digging through things most of the time? Most of the time, correct. Okay. Um, what days, <clears throat> first of all, let, let's start with, uh, I think Detective Baverstock testified that the torso was found on the 8th. Um, how long was the property kept and when was it finally released back into to Cress uh, as uh, out of the custody of the Dane County Sheriff's Department? So we turned the property back over to Cress on Monday, July 12th. Okay, so it was the 8th, the 9th, the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th. At some points those days, the Sheriff's Department was out there from the finding of the torso to the release. Uh, it was within your purview or within your custody? Yes. Okay. Uh, and the property itself, uh, just could you describe uh, the general property for us? I think the jury's seen pictures, but what was your view of the property? So it was a, a rural property. There was a, a main residential building. Um, there was an outbuilding, which would be best described as a large barn. Um, there was a smaller outbuilding that held chickens. Um, and then the property consisted of acreage, I would estimate, I don't know the exact number, but maybe 30 to 35 acres um, of varying topographical design. There was a large um, field with, with overgrowth that was maybe 12, 15 acres, and then surrounding that was wooded, wooded property. And if we look at this map, which has been admitted into evidence as exhibit number 57, when you talk about the field that was overgrowth, are you talking about this 
uh, part of the image that's on the right side? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yes. There, I think you said you were out there for two days. Were there two main days of searches after the initial finding of things, the day of the torso and the, and the garbage bin and things of that sort on the 8th? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. After the torso and the garbage bin were found by Detective Baverstock on the 8th, were there two primary days of searching that occurred after that that you were involved in? Yes, two days that I was involved in. Saturday, July 10th in the morning, and then Monday, July 12th in the morning. Um, and could you give us a look? Let's start with, I suppose, just because we talked about it, the field. Uh, was that field search, that grassy field? How did we go about doing that? Sorry. Yeah. Well, can I ask when this picture was taken? Sure. This was, and those are law enforcement vehicles out there. So uh, sometime later, uh, but while law enforcement was okay. out there. So the, the one field, I had actually spoke with Cress about it. She was letting it grow natural to try and bring back... Um, bee populations. So there was a large portion that had, um, I would say, need to, to waste high natural growth. There was some small shrubberies, there was thorns, there was tall grass. Um, so on Saturday, July 10th was when we did a line search of that area. And what do you mean by a line search? So everyone that was there to assist that day, we briefed ahead of time out in the field near this barn. Um, and then we, what we did was we lined up. Um, we tried to maintain um, an equal distance amongst each officer, not too far, but not too close. Um, and then we just systematically walked, started at one end and walked in a line down till we got to the other end. Um, if anyone saw anything that was of interest, you know, they would say stop and we'd all stop. If the line ever kind of got off canter where one side was, we would stop and reline up and so we'd keep walking till we got to the end, kind of turn the line, rotate the line around where the last person was, and, and go back up. Uh, based on what you know or any of your knowledge, is anything of evidentiary value found in that big field? No. Uh, going to maybe more the, wo the wooded portion, um, was, were the woods searched to the extent you could? Yes, it was my understanding that the woods had been searched prior, that there had been detectives that had gone through there. But we also did, as we searched the the field part, we also made our line kind of overlap with the wooded part, you know, and, and it was common to when we would turn overlap, have someone overlap the last where that, that end person had gone to make sure that we aren't potentially missing anything. Sure. And absent what Detective Baberstock and the other detectives have maybe talked about finding the first day on the 8th, uh, was anything found in the woods in your line search? Uh, no, not on the day that I was there. Okay. Now, uh, there was a residence, a house on this property. Correct? Yes, sir. Was that home searched at some point? Yes. Um, tell me about that. So that home was also searched on Monday, July 12th. Um, and uh, the homeowner, uh, was the homeowner there, Cress? Yes, Cress was. Okay. Uh, and it was anything of evidentiary value related ultimately to the case found in the house? No, no items of evidence were collected other than photographic evidence. Sure. Um, the driveway leading uh, all the way through, I know it looked like a long, windy driveway down to the road. Was that area in general searched? Yes, that would have been on Saturday uh, the 10th when we did the, the land and the property search. We also covered that the, the land all the way down to the road, and we even walked along the roadway. And I think we'll hear from that deputy later, but it'd be fair to say something of evidentiary value was found on, in that driveway up to the road search, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, now, there's a, a large, there's a shed, a barn on this property. Uh, was that barn searched? Yes, it was. Uh, can you tell me, based on what you know, um, how many folks were searching it and maybe how they go about something like that? So on Monday, July 12th, uh, there was six, myself and then six deputies, well, two de deputies and four detectives. Um, so we briefed ahead of time. And the way that that barn was searched was all six went in. Um, I was in and out, you know, asking if there's anything I could do to help or assist, but then also back at the residence with Cress. But the way the search was completed, as any search that I've been involved with, um, everyone coordinates and talks amongst themselves and will start in an area and, and communicate with their partners. I'll start here, you start here, we'll meet in the middle, and they just kind of systematically go through the building um, doing their best to cover searching every area that they can. Can you describe this barn? Yes, uh, it, it was a large barn. Um, I don't know the exact dimensions, but I would say it could probably have fit in maybe 
12 cars. Inside the barn, there was a SUV parked. There were two um, tractors, the, the ones that have kind of a single seat tractor, farm tractor. Um, there was also a workbench area. There was a lot of tools. Um, in the center of the barn, there was piled high, you know, various boxes and, and Tupperware containers, not Tupperware. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, the plastic boxes like you put your decorations in. Um, and then there was also some high shelving along that had things stored there. Um, a lot of old dusty tools. Okay. Um, and I, I think you mentioned that, so you, the property released back to Crest on the 12th? Yes. Uh, when you left on the 12th, um, were you comfortable with, with the property had being searched at that time and, and giving it back to the homeowner? Yes, I was comfortable that we'd done the best that we could. And um, had there been any question about, for me, whether we should stay longer, I would have told Crest we're going to stay longer. Sure. At that stage in the investigation, were there other areas that needed to be searched um, by maybe even some of the same sheriff's deputies that were there? Yes. Uh, just in general, what types of areas were you aware of that ultimately had to be searched? My understanding, in addition to that property on early when there was um, the primary residence, um, there was some wooded DNR land, there was waterways, and then there was also um, a, a large landfill. Sure. Um, were you later made aware um, a couple months after your search that the homeowner found a, a rifle in that barn? Yes, I was. Um, and possible you missed it in the original search? Yes. Okay. Any explanation or, or, or what could you say about that? Um, what could I, I could say about that is that I'm confident that um, the detectives and the deputies I was supervising that day were, were doing the best they could. Um, it was a vast property. It was there was a lot of items in there, um, and if it was missed during our search, it was oversight or human error. Sure. Uh, sometimes searches aren't 100% effective. I say we always do the best we can, but it would be naive to say we get 100% every time. You know, we try our best. Sure. Um, no further questions? Cross-examination. Yes, thank you. Lieutenant Torres, from July 8th to July 12th, I believe that's when you said that the, the property was under your custody or Dane County Sheriff's custody. Is that correct? Uh, to the best of my understanding, I wasn't there um, when the scene was, initi was initiated. So my only involvement with the case was on the July 10th and July 12th. Um, as your role as lieutenant, would you be able to know if the property was under, um, well, let me backtrack. So we learned earlier last week that during um, the search of the Oak Springs location, there was constantly someone from law enforcement that was guarding that location. Are you aware if that same thing happened here in the Irwin or Erlin location? Um, I'm not familiar with the location that you just referenced, but what I can say is the Irwin location from when the, um, you know, of, official word was that we were guarding it as a crime scene, um, we staffed a deputy there 24-7. So it was constantly being looked at from the time you determined it was a crime scene to the time you released it on the 12th? Yes, I can say we constantly had a deputy there. Um, and your role in lieutenant, if something was found, something of evidentiary value was found in that location, were you informed of that? At that time? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, the only item of evidentiary value that was collected either of the two days would have been on Saturday the 10th um, by Detective Danfini. Okay. Um, now, drawing your attention to the search of the barn, it's been called a barn or a shed. Um, you said you were there that day, correct? I was, yes. Approximately how many hours um, were devoted to searching this, this barn? Um, I can't say for certain how many hours we were in the barn, but from we arrived at that property probably about 8 a.m. And I believe the time that we all left, that the last law enforcement left, was about 11.30. So 8 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. or p.m.? A.m. Okay. Um, and could you describe a little bit more about how the search in the barn was conducted? You told us earlier about a line search and kind of gave us a detail 
um, explanation on how that was conducted. Could you mm -hmm. do something like that for the search of the barn? Sure. So whenever um, deputies and detectives have to search a big building like that, um, they coordinate amongst themselves and they walk in and they, they communicate with each other. I'll start here, you start there, we'll meet in the middle, for example. Um, so under, the, under that day, again, I was in and out, so I wasn't directly watching everyone that was searching the entire time. Um, but I do know and I did observe the uh, deputies and detectives communicating in that typical way of, I've searched this area, okay, now this is the area we have to do next, and, and moving through the building like that. And then um, did you feel like a thorough search of that barn was conducted that day? It, it, that day and that time, I felt as though we had done the best that we could to find evidence. So then later that day on the 12th was when the property was released back to the property owner, correct? Yes, ma'am. And nothing of evidentiary value was located in that property until later in October, I believe, correct? That's my understanding, but I was not involved in the case after July 12th. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any One moment, Judge. Sure. Uh, nothing further. The witness will be released but remaining under subpoena. Oh, so you're excused, but you remain under yes. subpoena and are not released yet from your subpoena. So don't talk about the case, but uh, you are free to go. And thank you very much for your time. Thank today. you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, Deputy. Good morning. If you feel you can do so safely and responsibly, testifying without your mask would be the preference here if you're able to do that. Sure. And thank you so much. Go right ahead, Counsel. Good morning. Could you please state your name for the record, spelling both your first and last names? Deputy Eric Schneider, E-R-I-K-S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R. -E -E How are you employed? I'm employed with the Dane County Sheriff's Office as a patrol deputy out of the Southeast Precinct and a member of the Dane County Sheriff's Office Crime Scene Unit. Tell me about that. You're, what does that mean, that you're a member of the Dane County Sheriff's Crime Scene Unit? My full-time position is patrol, um, but we also have some people that assist the two primary crime scene unit deputies, uh, Greg Leatherberry and Jim Plenty. So if they are unavailable or there's a particularly large or complicated scene, I will come out and I will work with them. Have you gone through any training in, to become part of the crime scene unit? I have. Can you just briefly describe that for the jury? Uh, there's an evident, a state crime lab evidence school that I attended, a five-day week-long school. There's an additional state lab photography course. I've done additional training, um, buried bodied, a buried body course that we put on ourselves. Um, off the top of my head, that's additional training. And as part of that training, learning how to collect items of evidence in a way that um, is both safe but also preserves the evidence? Yes. Um, all right, I think I will ask you a little bit about that individually. I'm now going to approach you with some photos, Exhibit 144 through 157. In this case in particular, one of the ways in which you worked as a crime scene unit deputy was um, at the Irwin property? Yes. Okay. Could you just briefly look through exhibits 144 through 157?
And as a group, would you describe exhibits 144 through 157 as photographs of the Irwin Road property um, during the search? Yes. Or at least some of them. Yes. There's many more. Do they appear to be true and accurate photographs? Yes. I would move 144 through 157 into evidence at this time. No objection. Thank you. They are received. And I will leave them up here in case you need to reference them. But what I'm going to play on the screen will also show up on your little screen. Okay. So how would you describe Exhibit 108 on your screen? Oh, I'm sorry, Judge. <laughs> Now, the property in question had a, a large barn or a shed. The immediate area around it was mowed, and beyond that was um, a large area of, like, prairie and a wood line. This is a section of the mowed grass butting up against that prairie to the south of the barn. And do you see an oil drum in that photograph? Yes. Uh, how would you describe Exhibit 109? There was a... a cut, um, like you see there, an odd-shaped cut um, on the north side of that oil drum, and inside were some items. And 110 shows some of those items inside? Yes, a saw blade, um, a scissors, and a smaller um, saw with like a chrome or a metal handle, and a bolt cutters. All right, and that's 112. Or shears, yes. All right, how did you package these various items? So let's start first with 139, which is the pruning shears. How did you collect and package them? Um, so at that time, I had um, CSI Greg Leatherberry with me. Um, he made a determination we we're gonna re remove the items. Um, and it just so happened that my arm span was long enough that I could reach them because they were deep inside the oil drum. So just using regular um, nitrile evidence gloves, I reached in and I was able to pull them out one at a time um, without touching areas that looked like they had stains. Um, we laid them out on paper and then um, CSI Leatherberry collected them in whatever packaging he used. And why do you wear gloves? To preserve the evidence, to keep it from either losing evidence or us from contaminating it. And do you change your gloves in between touching different items? Depending, yes. Um, and every time, well, I'm going to approach you now with Exhibit 139. These are the pruning shears. And Exhibit 139 has various stickers on it. Um, are some of those um, stickers, though, identification stickers from your office? Yes. And why is that done? Anything that is taken and put into evidence will have a unique tag number cataloging it. Okay. And this appears to have all the correct stickers? It does. Um, I'm going to ask you to open Exhibit 139. There so, and Deputy, and you're going to write a report after testifying here today. Is that fair? Because after. you are opening up evidence? Yes. And why do you do that? It's just to preserve the chain of custody. So anytime anybody opens up a box or an envelope that has evidence tape on it, a report is written about that encounter with the evidence? Yes. There's also a little knife if you prefer that. Would this be a good point for the stipulation on chain of custody? <laughs> yes, we, that's fine. As, as the deputy is opening this item of evidence, with regard to much of the physical evidence here, the parties have entered into a stipulation which I'll read to you at this time. Once again, 
Um, in this case, the district attorney and defendant's attorneys have stipulated to the following facts. Throughout the investigation into the deaths of Bart and Krista Halderson, many pieces of evidence were collected from the Halderson home, the Earlywine Road property, and the Roxbury, Wisconsin River land. These items of evidence were securely transported to various locations, including the medical examiner's office, the crime lab, to police evidence lockers, and ultimately to the courtroom. In some cases, there is a dispute that the evidence was not handled correctly, or that there is some dispute to the authenticity of the evidence. That is not the case here. The parties stipulate that there is no dispute to the chain of custody or authenticity of these items of evidence. The parties stipulate these items have remained in secure custody since being collected by police and have not been tampered with or altered in any way outside of the testing performed by the experts involved in this case. These items of evidence include the following. Number one, the human remains located at Early Wine Road and in the town of Roxbury. Number two, all items collected from the Early Wine Road property. Number three, all items collected from the Halderson home in Windsor, Wisconsin. Number four, all items of evidence tested by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab for DNA, fingerprints, footwear impressions, ballistics, and trace fit testing. And finally, number five, all swabs of purported DNA and blood, including the DNA sample taken from Chandler Halderson and Mitchell Halderson. Go ahead. Um, Deputy, could you please describe Exhibit 139? You can unwrap it further yeah. if you need to. Do you want me to remove it from the ties as well? Why don't you just describe it okay. first? Now, uh, the item in question is the large um, pruning shears, I guess they are, um, with red paint on the handle. And do those appear to be the same or in substantially the same condition as when you retrieved them from the Irwin Road property? Yes. At this time, I would move Exhibit 139 into evidence. No objection. It is received. It may be published. All right. Are they connected to the box or just no? Deputy, why don't you pick those up out of the box? Watch your step, but walk them in front of the jury, please. If you want to put them back in the box. Deputy, I'm now approaching you with what has been marked as Exhibit 140. Could you please open up Exhibit 140? How would you describe Exhibit 140? Exhibit 140 is the smaller saw that we saw in the picture of the oil drum with the chrome colored handle. And it, is it in substantially the same condition as when you collected it? Yes. At this time, I would move Exhibit 140 into evidence. No objection. It is received. And I would ask that you repeat the same procedure and um, show the jury. It's still tied in. Would you like me to remove it all the way? Yeah, if it's not too difficult. Turn 
Raymond, I wonder if we move the water pitcher, if it might give the deputy a little more room. Oh, absolutely. And if you want to place that one back in the box, 140. And I'll give you a minute to change your gloves. Here's a little scan. Now I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 141. Could you please open up the box and tell us what 141 is? Exhibit 141 is the broken saw blade from that oil drum that we saw in the picture. And is it in the same or substantially the same condition as when you collected it? Yes. I would move Exhibit 141 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received. Okay. Um, I think this one could probably stay in the box, but do you want to display that to the jury, please? If you want to close that box and change your gloves. change my gloves because I'm just handling the box. Could you please open exhibit 142?
And how would you describe Exhibit 142? Exhibit 142 is the scissors with the red handle from inside the drum. Are they in the same or substantially the same condition as when you collected them? They are. I would ask to move 142 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received. And again, will you display for the jury? That's the last piece of physical evidence for the moment. If you just want to remove your gloves, that would be fine. Deputy, did you participate um, at any point in the search of the barn or shed, as it's been called, on the Irwin Road property? Yes. And would you describe Exhibit 144 as displayed on your screen? Exhibit 144 is the large barn or shed in question that you're talking about. And Exhibit 145, what does it display? A portion of the interior of the barn. There's lots of stuff in the barn. There is a lot of stuff in the barn. Exhibit 146. What does 146 display? Uh, 146 is probably the eastern portion of the barn. Uh, the two entrances face north-south to the barn. So if you're coming in from the north, which faces the house, to your left would be this area. And 147, what does that display? 147 is a silver-gray colored tarp that was located I believe the ninth or I believe the night of the eighth when we were the first night we were at the property so that was the night that the torso was discovered correct um, and is it fair to say this was found during like a cursory search of the barn yes while we were meeting waiting for the search warrant to be finalized we had the medical examiner's office um, out there and the director, Ehrman, had his canine. So while we were waiting, um, we thought we would utilize the canine while we had it to see if it could find anything, and it led us directly to that tarp. And, of course, at this point, Crest had given you folks permission to be yes. on your property and search. All right. 148, what does that display? That is the same tarp after we removed it from where we located it. Let me just go back and ask you one question. Um, the dog that uh, medical director Ehrman had, um, was that a cadaver canine dog? I believe his is, yes. 149, what is displayed on exhibit 149? The same tarp, just from a different angle. You can see some the beginning of some red staining there. 150? Another, we're starting to slowly unfold it, um, and again, more more red staining. So I think at that point or shortly thereafter, we stop because um, we believe it has that cherry valley and we wouldn't want to ruin it or contaminate it on scene. So why did you stop? Um, that should be we. That should be something that's processed in a, in a more controlled environment. Um, we had a lot going on there, so we weren't going to unravel that in the middle of a dirt floor and begin processing it there. That's something that'll be done later in a lab. Sure, so it was sent to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab? I believe that that one was. Okay. I'm actually just going to touch the bag. So. 
Deputy, I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 143. There are various stickers. Are there stickers on Exhibit 143 from your office? Yes. Um, and do, do any of those stickers tell you what is inside of Exhibit 143? Yes. Okay. And do those all appear to be in order? They do. At this time, I would move Exhibit 143 into evidence. No objection. It is received. And we are not going to open 143 at this time. I will put it over here, though. And uh, Deputy, were you made aware in October of 2021 that after the Sheriff's Office had finished their investigation of the Irwin Road property, the homeowner found a rifle? Yes. Okay. Um, how would you describe Exhibit 151? An interior portion um, of the shed. Um, as you can see, there's just a lot of clutter and various objects. 152? That would be the western side of the barn. Um, there's a large trailer, and around it you can just see all kinds of various items and clutter. 153? That would be the northwest corner of the barn. A uh, large number of tools and old saw blades and that kind of stuff. As a member of the crime scene unit, um, do buildings with this amount of material in it pose any um, obstacles in doing a search? They do, particularly at this time. Um, our resources were at a premium as we had a primary crime scene now at the scene of the residence in Windsor. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 154. Could you just briefly describe 154? an overall shot of the size and interior of the barn. 155. Um, from that same corner facing south across, um, you can see there's a second tractor behind that one and a vehicle near the entrance of the barn. 156. More views are taken from across the other side inside the barn, just detailing rows of objects and items. 157. Of you looking uh, north from the south entrance, um, looking back, and you can see the, the second trailer more clearly, and just a lot of piles of wood um, and debris. Exhibit 70. This was taken in October after the owner had been clearing out the barn. Um, Objects were removed, and you can see there is now a black rifle propped up alongside those boards. And I'm using the laser pointer. Deputy, can you turn your head? Am I identifying the right area where the rifle is located? Exit that rifle was found behind some boards. Yes. 172? Or, I'm sorry, 72. Oh, just uh, another closer view of the rifle. I just took overall and photographs and continuing all the way up to the, the rifle itself. And what is picture 73 a picture of? A close-up of the rifle, which shows the serial number on the upper portion. If you want to glove up. Deputy, I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 291. This end is much heavier. Um, I would ask at this time that you open Exhibit 291 for yourself and 
view what is inside. As this process is going on, I'll just let the jury know that, that obviously Randy is becoming involved in this part. He's responsible for the security of this room, so any time, whether for evidentiary purposes or not, there's a firearm brought into this space, uh, he takes a, a keen interest and role in that for everyone's safety and security. And Deputy, could you just tell me um, what exhibit 291 is. This is that same <clears throat> same black rifle we saw in the photographs. Um, that you collected at the Irwin Road property hidden behind a board? Correct. It is a uh, Norinco SKS 76 by 39 caliber rifle. And is it in the same or substantially same condition as when you collected it? Yes, it has a red dot sight and a camouflage colored strap on it. I would move Exhibit 291 into evidence at this time. No Any objection. Object no objection that is received. And we'll give Randy a minute to secure it. Deputy, if you would um, take Exhibit 291 out of the box and display it carefully for the jury. Thank you. If you want to put it back in the box, Randy, did you want to take ownership of it or? Okay. Scissors. because the tape is undone, the box is not perfectly closed. Deputy, did you attend the autopsy of Mr. Halderson's torso? I did. And that occurred at the medical examiner's office? Yes. I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 553 and 554. I'm not going to ask you to remove these from the boxes or anything, but um, based on the markings that are on, the, on 553 and 554, could you please identify them? Item 553 um, is a, a jacket and fragment that was retrieved um, from the rear neck area of the torso. And item 554 um, is additional fragments from a bullet retrieved from the abdomen. And those were retrieved from the torso by the medical examiner during the autopsy? Correct. I would move exhibits 553 and 554 into evidence at this time. No objection. They are received.
no further questions. Cross-examination. Thank you. Good morning, Deputy. Good morning. Now, you, um, just so I'm clear, you searched this barn or shed at the Irwin address um, a couple of times? Uh, there was an official search on the 12th that some detectives did, yes. And there was a cursory search the night of the finding of the torso? I wouldn't even call it a search, but yeah, like a walk around and the, and the canine went through it. Were you there for both of these events? Yes. Did you participate in the, the search? And I understand the first one may not have been technically the kind of search we're talking about, did, but did you participate both times in looking for things in that shed? I documented the search by photographing it. I did not search per se myself. Now the first time, how many people were looking around that barn? You're talking the first night on the 8th? Yes. Four of us, I believe. And the second time, how many people were looking around that barn? Um, without looking at the log, I don't recall who was all there, maybe six. And each time before looking or before searching, is it fair to say that discussions were had and a plan was made as to how to do the search and what things in particular would be notable? Yes. So for example, you might want to say, let's look for footprints or shoe impressions, correct? As an example. In this case, you knew about the uh, torso with the gunshots before the second search, correct? Yes. So is it fair to say that one strategy for the search would be to look for any firearms, correct? Yes. Now, I heard you say that resources were at a premium around the time of the second search. Did I get that correct? Yes. The Sheriff's Department, or you in particular, between that moment when resources were at a premium and October when this firearm was found in the barn, uh, you didn't go back to search further, correct? I did not. I can't tell you if there were additional searches. There's no sheriff's department rules or protocol that would prevent anyone from going back and searching again, correct? Well, we would, I mean, if we were going to do that, we would either need the permission of the homeowner or an additional search warrant. Given the search, given the circumstances, we would procure another warrant anyway. And you obtained both of those the first time, right? When I was there, yes. Now, you took possession of the firearm, the SKS that was found in that barn, correct? Yes. So you physically lifted it up from its location, is that right? Yes. Are you familiar with something called a flash suppressor? No. That's all I have, thank you. Any redirect? No. May these, this witness be excused? Yes. And released? No. All right, you're excused from testifying further today, sir. Thank you very much, have a good remainder of your day. And the next witness, please. Stick calls Dan Feeney. able to safely and responsibly testify without a mask, that would be our preference. Thank you very much. Yes. Right ahead. Good morning. Please state and spell your name for us. My name is uh, Dan Feeney. 
uh, Dan, D-A-N, Feeney, F-E-E-N-E-Y. What do you do for a living, sir? I'm a detective with the Dane County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been in that role? Since May of 2021. Early part of July 2021, were you asked to assert, uh, assist in the search of the Irwin Road property uh, in reference to the homicides of uh, Bart Halderson and Krista Halderson? Yes, I was. And uh, what was your role in this search? Uh, my role was searching the grounds on the Irwin Road property uh, on foot. Uh, particularly uh, at some point where you asked to search maybe the driveway leading down to the road, that area? Yes. Okay. No, sure. And did you find anything of evidentiary interest in this case? Yes, I found some items in the garbage can. All right. I'm showing you what's been marked. In this case is exhibits number 158 through 167. Could you page through those real quick and just let me know um, when you're done, in general, what they are? Uh, these are the items that were located in the garbage can at the Irwin Road address. And what were those items that were of interest to you? Um, it was a uh, grocery-style plastic bag containing uh, some cleaning material. Uh, I believe it was white rags as well as a couple, two Brillo pads inside of it. Okay. Uh, and uh, did you collect these items? I did. I, move, I think I've already moved. Uh, all but two of them, but I'll move 158 through 167 uh, into evidence and ask to publish them. No and objection. They are received. They may be published. They should appear on the computer monitor directly in front of you, sir. I, starting with exhibit number 158, what are we looking at there? You're looking at the garbage cans at the start of the driveway with the target bag uh, located inside the garbage can in front of it. And uh, that target bag, was uh, it's, it's removed there. Was it in that location when you found it? Uh, it was inside the garbage can to the right with the black lid. And exhibit 159, is that that garbage can? Yes. When you found, uh, go back to 158, when you found 158, was it the only item that was in that garbage can? Yes, it was. Uh, 160, what are we looking at there? Uh, we had, uh, the bag was previously tied off, so we had opened it up uh, to observe what was inside of the bag. 161, uh, what is that? That is the sticker that was on the outside of the target bag um, that has a uh, Melender, comma, C as the owner, or excuse me, the person that would have picked up the property from Target. Uh, and I know from the investigation it's potentially Catherine Melender. 162, what are we looking at there? This is the garbage bag or the plastic bag inside of the target bag containing the uh, white rags and Brillo pads. There's a red substance there that we can see? Yes. What did that appear to be to you? Uh, there was a large amount of red and brownish substance, which, through my training experience, I recognize as potentially dried blood. 163, what am I looking at? Looking at the rags again with one of the Brillo pads. You say Brillo pad kind of in the exact center where I'm pointing the laser up on the big screen. That's the Brillo pad? Yes, sir. Were those Brillo pads themselves stained or were they new? Uh, no, they were used. Uh, they also had the similar brown reddish uh, staining on it as the rags did in the bag. 164, what are we looking at there? Just the uh, target bag that was uh, the exterior bag with the uh, rags located in. Okay. A couple of views of that, 165. Yes. Same thing, yep. 166. Interior of the bag. 167. Interior as well. When you collected these items, um, did they have any sort of smell to them? Uh, yes. Right when I opened up the bag, it was an immediate uh, uh, smell of what I described as cleaning material. The closest thing that came to my mind was like rubbing alcohol. Um, and then it was just overtaken by a rancid, putrid smell. No further questions. Cross-examination. Good morning, Deputy. Morning. As part of your role in this investigation at that Irwin Road location, uh, you did canvas the area, correct? I did. Going from home to home, seeing if anyone had, for example, ring or surveillance video, correct? I did, yes. And just generally talking to people to see if they saw anything that might be helpful, correct? Yes. That's all. Thank you. 
any redirect? It's a pretty rural area. Yeah, it's very rural, yes. Were there any uh, direct next door neighbors right across the street from the driveway? Uh, no, slightly down the roadway. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. May this witness be excused? Just excused. You may be excused from further testifying today, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we can do one more if they're of the same length of time. Yeah. 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 I think that's fine, Judge. State would call James Plenty to the stand. Randy, I will need Exhibit 174, which I believe is in your room. All right. Good morning again. Good morning. And um, I, Deputy Plenty, I assume your name is still spelled the same as it was a few days ago? Correct. Okay. Um, you previously testified that you were a deputy. Are you also a member of the crime scene unit? That's correct as well. Have you gone through any trainings um, in order to become a member of the crime scene unit? Correct. I've attended a basic uh, evidence technician school um, and uh, other additional training for more specific uh, areas of expertise in, in uh, being part of the crime scene unit. Okay. And... Could you just briefly list a few of those topics for the jury that you've had trainings on? Uh, it would include, but not limited to, uh, collection of DNA with a buckle swab, um, uh, shooting reconstruction school, um, blood spatter school, uh, things of that nature as well, in addition to uh, the basic evidence uh, technician school that I've attended. And how long have you been a member of the crime scene unit? Since 2012. Okay. And Deputy, I'm going to approach you with a series of photographs, exhibits 168 through 172. Then there's exhibits 544 and 545, as well as exhibits 345 through 358. Um, could you please look through exhibits 168 through 172, 544, and How would you describe exhibits 168 through 172 and then 545 and 544? Uh, in general, they're, they are pictures of um, the uh, bin that was recovered uh, on the property in the township of Cottage Grove uh, to include um, some of the pictures will show a gray in color tarp that is uh, positioned inside of the uh, bin as well. And did all these photographs appear to be true and accurate? Correct. I would move 168 through 172 into evidence, one, or, and then 544 and 545 into evidence at this time. No objection. They are received. And just for simplicity's sake, um, could you please look at 345 through 358?
And how would you describe that grouping of photographs? Uh, these photos were uh, during a search and collection of footwear that was located at the property in the uh, village of Windsor. Okay. Do they all appear to be true and accurate depictions of what you observed? Correct. I would move 345 through 358 into evidence at this time. No objection. It, they are received. <clears throat> all right. And Deputy, if you would look at the little screen in front of you there. Could you please describe, it says Exhibit 58, but I know it's Exhibit 158. Could you please describe Exhibit 158 for the jury? Uh, so this is a uh, Rubbermaid brand uh, indicated on the front side of it. It's not visible uh, from this picture, uh, but it's Rubbermaid brand um, trash bin. Um, it stands probably approximately three and a half to four feet high, um, and it has a gray or silver um, colored tarp uh, that was positioned in the inside of it. Um, it's in a wooded area, um, approximately, uh, it was 10 yards within the uh, uh, wood line on that property. And how would you describe 168? This would be the same item, uh, just a different um, uh, view of that same bin. And 169, I believe, how would you describe 169? So what, what we have here is the same um, location, a photograph of the same location. Uh, the only difference is, is that the uh, bin with the tarp inside has been removed. Uh, it shows the vegetation that was underneath of the bin is still green and lush. Why is that significant? Uh, if the bin had been there for uh, a significant amount of time, uh, not allowing that vegetation to receive sunlight, then it would um, turn yellow, brown, and perhaps die. Exhibit 170, what is Exhibit 170? This uh, 170 is uh, a look into uh, that same bin that I've mentioned already. Uh, it includes that tarp that I previously mentioned, and it has um, adhered to the uh, side of the bin a yellow piece of what appeared to be yellow duct tape. And Deputy, if you would just turn your head towards the big screen, I'm going to use the laser pointer. Is this the item that you are calling yellow duct tape? Correct. And for the record, that is slightly lower than middle and slightly to the right on Exhibit 170. That seems accurate. Exhibit 171. Another picture of the garbage bin with the tarp and tape. Correct. Hmm. All right. Um, what is Exhibit... Oh, I'm sorry, this has the wrong numbers on it. 544 display. You can look on your screen. So what is this exhibit? Yes. What was your question? Yes. Uh, it is the same Rubbermaid uh, bin that was recovered from just inside the woods. Uh, it also has uh, the, uh, the tarp that was included with that. No, sorry, that is actually 172. I apologize. Um, Judge, can we switch to the Elmo? Certainly. And I believe this will also be on the screen in front of you. Deputy, this is Exhibit 544. How would you describe Exhibit 544? Uh, again, this is the, uh, the Rubbermaid bin, uh, and it shows um, another view angle of the yellow duct tape that was inside of that bin. In an Exhibit 544, I would describe the duct tape as slightly lower than middle and slightly to the left. Does that appear to be accurate? Correct. Okay. And 545. Just a crime lab view of the mm -hmm. bin. Side view of the um, Rubbermaid bin. Mm -hmm. If we could go back to the PowerPoint. And 
And Deputy, this part may be easier if you're actually willing to come down off the witness stand, if that's okay with the judge. Yes, We're just going to look at the stickers. Just be sure and speak uh, loudly so that everybody can hear. Can you look at the stickers as to Exhibit 174? Item 174 is listed as a black rolling uh, garbage bin with tarp. And I'm not going to open up Exhibit 174, but that is the garbage bin that we've been looking at pictures in pictures 172 and such. Okay. Phil, please sit down. And Deputy, did you, in collecting the garbage bin, did you remove the tarp from the garbage bin? Uh, we did not. Why didn't you do that? Uh, we did not want to disturb uh, the positioning of the tarp inside uh, and also or disturb any uh, evidence significant to uh, the tarp being inside of the trash can, the bin. We also knew that, um, or we had talked about sending it to the state crime lab uh, for uh, testing and And in such. fact, it was submitted to the Wisconsin state crime lab. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna shift gears here. You are also part of the 4595 Oak Springs Circle search, part of the crime scene unit there. Correct. Can you please describe what room exhibit 227 is in? Uh, this is in the garage, which is attached to the residence. Um, and of note, specifically, this picture shows a whole bunch of shoes. That's correct. Exhibit 345. What is an Exhibit 345? Uh, 345 is, like previously mentioned, um, a fair amount of uh, footwear that was located in the garage. And most of it is kind of out in the open. Correct. Um, but there is something peeking back there. Do you do, go and search that area back behind the shelving unit? Correct. Uh, I had, so the shoes that are on this, what appears to be a rubber mat, I had pulled that mat uh, back towards myself and was able to retrieve uh, what was a pair of shoes that were underneath the shelving unit. Um, 546, another view of the mini shoes. Correct. And in this photo, 546, there appears to be some floral shoes at the top. Where were those floral shoes located? So um, they were located underneath the shelving unit uh, in the previous uh, photo. That black type mat that the shoes are resting on was uh, forward towards the shelving unit, I had pulled that back in order to uh, have access to these other pair of shoes. So the mat was in 545, the mat is up against the shelving unit. Slightly under, correct. And is yeah. that the floral shoes kind of peeking out there, hidden? Correct, that was the pair of shoes that I had uh, pulled out from underneath. All right. And now are present in this photo. 347, what is displayed in photo 347? Uh, 347, um, it's the shoes that were located uh, in front of the shelving unit, as well as the, um, the other pair um, that were positioned underneath the shelving unit as well. And why did shoes become important in this case? The uh, state crime lab had uh, advised that there were footwear um, patterns on tarps that were located um, during this investigation. So they wanted to have uh, the footwear from the residents collected uh, and photographed to document um, footwear patterns and types of shoes that were in the residence. And exhibit 354, what is exhibit 354 a picture of? 
these are Brooks brand shoes. Uh, model would be Launch 5 athletic shoes. 355? It's the same footwear, uh, just with one of them turned upside down to display the, the footwear pattern. And in 355, the shoe that is turned upside down, there appears to be twigs or grass or something in the There's the some bed. organic debris on there, yeah. 356, what is 356 a picture of? So that is the same shoe that was in the previous uh, slide um, that was turned upside down. Uh, what we see in that, uh, the left side line that runs um, up and down, there is a reddish brown stain towards the bottom of that line in the uh, footwear tread. So I'm using my laser pointer to highlight. It appears to be almost smack dab middle in the photo. Correct. And what does 357 show? Uh, again, shows the same uh, shoe that's turned upside down, um, but here this shows the the toe area, the tip of the toe area, and there's red staining uh, as well on that. 358, what does Exhibit 358 show? Uh, 358 shows both shoes that are resting on the sole, and it shows the shoe which is on the right side, has red staining on the tongue. Um, on the end of the launch word has a, a red, reddish brown stain on it. There should be some gloves up there if you want to glove up. Supposed to be some scissors and an exacto knife. I'm going to show you, Deputy, what has been marked as Exhibit 359. Um, could you please like, open up Exhibit 359 and just verbally say what is inside? And verbally, how would you identify Exhibit 359? So these are the footwear, the um, Brooks Launch 5 footwear that I located. And do they appear to be in the same or substantially the same condition as when you collected them? The same condition. Okay. At this time, I would move Exhibit 359 into evidence. No objection. They are received. I'm just going to have you walk them in front of the jury, um, just back and forth. Thank you, Deputy. If you want to try to put them back in there. <laughs> And of course, the staining on those shoes 
was swabbed by the crime lab? Correct. Okay. All right, you can go ahead and get rid of your gloves. I'm going to show you Exhibit 348. What is Exhibit 348? Uh, 348 uh, is the right shoe of the shoes that were located underneath of the shelving unit. Uh, you can see the left shoe is at the top of the picture. Uh, inside of this right shoe, uh, there was this foil uh, wrapped item. I'm only going to hold the bag, so I will let you glove up and open up And I think removing one is fine. They're, I, they're just a matching set. Mm -hmm. sure. um, and is exhibit 390 the same or in substantially the same condition as when you collected it from the 4595 Oak Spring Circle address? It is, correct. Yeah. Could you please just walk that shoe back and forth in front of the jury? Feel free to put that back in the bag. I don't think we moved that one into evidence. Oh, I'm sorry. I moved 390 into evidence at this objection. time. No objection. It is received. Okay. And what does Exhibit 349 show? So the previous slide showed uh, a item that was wrapped in foil. Uh, this is then myself opening this foil wrapped item. Uh, what we see here is a sheet of paper towel that uh, is wrapped around the contents. We can see a portion of a photo Wisconsin driver's license. And just beyond that is the black item is a cell phone. And in the process of searching and collecting evidence, did you in fact collect the foil and the paper towel as you described displayed in Exhibit 349? Correct. Okay. And I'm not going to have you open these if you can identify them from your office's stickers. Um, 388, how would you describe 388? Uh, 388 is the paper towel sheet that is uh, in the photo. And I see JP, those are your initials, you Correct. collected it. Mm -hmm. And exhibit 389, what is exhibit 389? And 389 is the foil sheet that was used to wrap the contents. And uh, there's my initials on this as well. All right, I would move 388 and 389 into evidence at this time. No objection. They are received. And Deputy, do you continue to unwrap this evidentiary president? present? I continue to unwrap it, correct. Mm -hmm. And what is Exhibit 350 display? Uh, so what we see here, we can still see the foil sheet. We can still see the paper towel sheet. Um, we can see now um, Bart Helderson's Wisconsin-issued um, photo driver's license. And we can see the Apple... Uh, iPhone that is located underneath the driver's license. What is 351 display? So 351, um, 
is the uh, the top phone, the black phone that we saw in the last picture. It is now, uh, along with the driver's license, simply just turned over. Um, and we can see Krista's uh, Wisconsin uh, driver's license and an additional phone. So both phones and driver's license were wrapped together in the same packaging? Correct. Could you please describe 352? Uh, again, it's the, uh, the foil, uh, it's the paper towel sheet, it's the two phones. Uh, Bart's driver's license is not visible. It's on the underside of the uh, left phone. Uh, we can see Krista's driver's license uh, resting on top of the phone on the right side. And 353. And this would be uh, Krista's Wisconsin driver's license and a phone located underneath of that. And there, I don't think you need to glove up. I'm not going to ask you to open up any of these items. I'm actually going to have you sit down so we can hear you nice and clearly. Exhibit 387, how would you describe Exhibit 387? It is a photo of Wisconsin driver's license that's been issued to uh, Christina Hel Helderson. And has your nice initials on there? That's correct. And it appears to be in the same condition as when you collected it? It does. I would move Exhibit 387 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Exhibit 386, how would you describe Exhibit 386? Uh, photo of Wisconsin driver's license that's been issued to Bart Helderson, uh, and it does have my initials on it and in the same condition. Okay. I would move exhibit 386 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received. And 384 and 385. Could you please describe 384 and 385? Uh, 384 is uh, iPhone that was located uh, in the foil packaging. Uh, it has my initials on it, and uh, while it's packaged, I would believe it's in the same condition as when I had recovered it. <clears throat> and 385 uh, is a white iPhone, uh, which was in the pictures that were previously shown. Again, my initials are on it, and I would imagine it is in the same condition as when I had recovered that one. And these are the phones that were wrapped in the paper towel, wrapped in the foil, hidden in a shoe, hidden under a shelf. Correct. I would move 385 and 384 into evidence at this time. No objection. They are received. Deputy, in the course of this investigation, were you asked to take a buckle sample from Chandler, Chandler Halderson in compliance with a search warrant? Correct. Um, and did you, in fact, do that? I did. Um, could you please identify, do you see Mr. Halderson in the courtroom today? I do. Just so that we're consistent with our record, I'd ask everyone who's not in the jury box to lower their mask briefly so that the witness can observe every face. Thank you. Go ahead and replace your masks. Do you see Mr. Halderson? I do. Could you please identify him by where he's seated and perhaps the color of his shirt? He is seated at the defense table. The shirt is perhaps a lavender type color. I would uh, ask the record to reflect that the witness has identified Mr. Halderson. It shall. And what is a buckle swab? Uh, it's the swabbing of uh, inside of the, the mouth. So we're collecting a DNA sample from that area. And does it um, come in a kit or what tools do you it, use? It comes in an envelope, which includes um, two swabs to, to administer the test. And you've had training on this procedure? Correct. I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 360. I'm not going to ask you to open it, but could you please identify Exhibit 360? Uh, it is the buckle swabs that I had collected from uh, Mr. Uh, Helderson. Uh, it is initialed by myself as well. All right. At this time, I would move Exhibit 360 into evidence. No objection. It's received. No 
No further questions. Cross-examination. Yes, thank you. Deputy Plenty, your, this was your first time in the Halderson household, correct? I'm, I'm sorry, what's that question? This was your first time being in the Halderson household, correct? In the Halderson house? Yes. Uh, this, this incident, correct? So prior to this incident, you've never been in the home? Correct. Uh, you wouldn't know where exactly all shoes in the household are located, correct? Uh, by the end of the search, uh, we had gone through the house pretty thoroughly, and I had located um, or had uh, pointed out to me the shoes that were located in the house. So by the end of the search, you were very familiar where all the shoes in the home were located, correct? Correct. But you don't necessarily know if that's where they were located prior to this incident or if they were always kept in the same place. Where the shoes were kept in the household prior to uh, our arrival to it, correct. Uh, where the shoes were located, I wouldn't know where they're commonly located. And um, it looks like as far as all of the shoes, there were a couple of shoes that were located in the, or we saw in those photographs, correct? There were so, so, several shoes, correct. Yeah. Um, and it looks like only one pair of shoes um, had any kind of staining of interest. Is that fair? Correct. And as far as the staining on those shoes, I believe we were able to identify maybe three little stains. Does that sound about right? I don't recall the exact number, but I can think of three stains that were on the shoes, correct. Um, and the shoes... Would you identify them or would you describe them as being worn? They were worn shoes. Correct. It's obvious that they were used regularly, correct? They've been used, yes. Um, and there was even some debris um, located on the bottom of the shoes as well, correct? Correct. I have no further questions for you. Thank you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? He may. Thank you, sir. Have a good remainder of your day. As everyone could guess, we're at the 90-minute mark or a little past. Thank you, folks. We'll take a 15-minute break at this time. We'll stand in recess. Could we turn off the H? Good morning, everybody. My name is James Langer. I am the digital content manager for channel3000.com. As you just heard, they're going to take their uh, typical mid-morning break here in day five of the Chandler Halderson trial. So we're starting week two over here. Um, and testimony continued this morning with prosecution continuing to call all their witnesses. Uh, if you're just joining us now or missed uh, the start of proceedings. They started at about 8.45 as usual this morning. Uh, what we've heard so far is testimony from several members of the Dane County Sheriff's Office, uh, kind of going through their searches of both the farm and cottage grove where Bart Halderson's remains were found, as well as the Halderson home itself. So uh, we, we heard some testimony on what was found there, including uh, some what appeared to be sawing or cutting tools that were found in an oil drum uh, nearby where Bart Halderson's uh, severed torso was found. Uh, they also found some tarps and things like that in, in the woods and as well as the shed that's nearby. Um, one of the main things I wanted to highlight is uh, we, we kind of saw the defense really start to question something kind of for the first time in this trial. They haven't had a lot of questions in cross-examination, but when it came to the topic of the rifle that was found inside uh, the shed, it wasn't found, um, as we learned last week, until months later. Uh, the owner of that property was cleaning out the, the shed uh, at that time and came across a stack of boards propped against the wall. She uncovered it and she found a a SKS rifle propped up against the wall there. Uh, she had testified that it, it wasn't hers. She had never seen it before, um, didn't know how it got there. So she called the authorities and, and they uh, brought that in sort of as part of this investigation here. Um, so we, we heard from one of the deputy, a couple of deputies actually, or members of the sheriff's office who had uh, searched that shed in July and came up with nothing and basically they were asked straight up, uh, 
you didn't find this? Is there any reason why one of the lieutenants testified? You know, it, they did what they could with the resources they had at that time. Uh, multiple people testifying that the sheriff's office resources were kind of uh, stretched thin at that time because they had two major crime scenes now that they were trying to process and, and a lot of things to go through. Um, so they testified that it's possible that they had just missed this, especially if it was sort of concealed in the back there and, and they didn't find it. So um, they they had to answer some questions from the defense on, on how they could have missed this. And um, again, sort of the defense pointing out that it, it's possible that, you know, uh, there was nobody there between July and October. They don't know when that gun could have gotten there. There's really no proof on on when that gun was placed there. So that's sort of what the defense was trying to get at with um, some of these questions there. After that, we heard from another deputy um, testifying about the search at the Holderson home and what they found there. And the really point of interest here has been the, the search of the garage, the attached garage to the Holderson home. Uh, they had a bunch of shoes stored there, uh, like like a lot of families probably do in, in their attached garage. And uh, they found they focused on a pair of shoes here. Uh, one, a set of what they described as athletic shoes that had um, some grass on the bottom and a few reddish or brownish uh, stains. Obviously, when you're in a murder investigation, any shoes with a red or brown stain on them, uh, possibly indicating dried blood, would be a point of interest. So they took a lot of photos of those. We saw those. Uh, we heard that investigators started to really look at the shoes after the state crime lab had found some footprints on the tarps that they were looking through. So um, they, they went through and, and showed the jury all these shoes as well, uh, even paraded it around in, in front of the jury just so they could get a closer look there at those shoes. A second pair of shoes had sort of like a floral print on them. They were kind of tucked away underneath a shelving unit, the, the deputy testified. And when they looked inside, they actually found a foil wrap package inside. When they unwrapped it, what they found inside were the driver's licenses and cell phones of Bart and Krista Holderson. Uh, so again, defense kind of asking, you know, we don't know where those shoes originally were or, or that kind of thing, but um, investigators said when they did look inside, they, they found the phones and driver's licenses of Bart and Krista Halderson uh, seemingly hidden away, tucked inside a pair of shoes in the garage. So uh, those are kind of the highlights that we've seen so far this morning. We're going to expect um, a lot more of the evidence to be presented this morning. Um, as we head into the the next part of the trial here, um, you know, last week we, we heard a lot of the relationship aspect and, and sort of the scene setting, if you were, uh, in this trial. And now we're starting to see a lot more of the physical evidence the prosecution is presenting here. They brought all the exhibits in. They unboxed them. They had the, the deputies and the investigators show the show the actual you know saw blades and scissors and things like that that they had found on the scenes so the jury is getting to see these up close and personal as well uh, so we will continue to monitor that as we head into the late morning and, and early afternoon hours as the prosecution begins to or continues to present their case i should say as we you know have been talking about the entire time here prosecutors say that their case could take up to three weeks to present and we're, we're just starting week two here day five of this trial so plenty more to get through plenty more to watch uh, we will continue to bring you these updates as they uh, take these breaks and just make sure that you have everything you need to know to, to stay up to date on this trial uh, if you miss any of this at all we have all these recaps over at channel 3000.com just go to our homepage there there's that banner at the top of the page Click that, it'll take you to our page for this trial. You'll get all the updated information you need from every day of the trial. You can watch it live. You get these live streams here as well. Um, that URL also I should mention in the description of these live streams. So click that link if you are wondering what happened and, and you need to catch up. So uh, we will 
duck out here for a few minutes here while they continue to uh, take this mid-morning break, but we'll bring you all the updates once they're back in session. As a reminder, we can only show things when jury is in. We can't, you know, take you to the courtroom before the jury is seated. So we'll be back live once the jury is brought back in from this most recent break. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Stay tuned, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes here.
Attorney Raymond. Thank you. The state calls Deputy Greg Leatherberry to the stand. Sir, if you feel you can do so safely and responsibly, testifying without the mask would be the preference if you can. Thank you so much. Go right ahead. Good morning. Could you please state your name for the record, both first and last, and spell both? Greg Leatherberry, G-R-E-G-L-E-A-T-H-E-R-B-E-R-R-Y. How are you employed? I'm a deputy sheriff with the Dane County Sheriff's Office. And were you employed as such in July of 2021? Yes, I was. And what unit of the Dane County Sheriff's Office do you belong to? I'm a, currently assigned to the crime scene unit where I've been working uh, for the past 22 years. I've been a deputy sheriff with the Dane County Sheriff's Office for 29 years. I'm going to show you, Deputy, what has been marked as Exhibit 175. How would you identify Exhibit 175? Uh, this is the my CV. Okay. And for those that are not in the scientific community, that's like a resume? That is correct, yes. But it has all your trainings. and Can you just name a few of the trainings that you have participated in? Uh, I've participated in the uh, basic recruit academy, um, the jail school. From there, I went on to uh, patrol and uh, <clears throat> ultimately ended up in the crime scene unit where I've received numerous hours of training. Uh, I've received training at Fox Valley Technical College uh, for the two-week evidence tech program. I have attended the uh, Wisconsin State Death Investigation School, the two-week program at Green Lake I have attended the uh, Death Investigation School at Northwestern University. I've attended the Bloodstain Pattern Analysis Training at the BCA in Minnesota, which is the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. I've had fingerprint training from the FBI, um, and there's numerous more uh, schools as well. At this time, I would move Exhibit 175 into evidence. Any objection? No objection. It is received. As part of your job working for the Dane County Sheriff's Office Crime Scene Unit, do you also work in cooperation with the Crime Scene Unit from the Department of Justice? That is correct. Yes, I do. And do you also work in concert with the Wisconsin State Crime Lab? Yes. How, how does working in cooperation with those departments um, assist you in your job duties? Well, they have subject matter experts that uh, have more extensive training in particular disciplines um, that can assist us when it comes to processing a scene or to do further, further analysis of evidence that we collect. Um, and those items that get submitted to the crime lab um, are items that they would do the analysis on that we request for them to do. In the midst of this case, were you asked by the fingerprint expert at the Wisconsin State Crime Lab to get more complete or better fingerprints from Mr. Halderson? Yes, there was, there was a request for uh, additional fingerprints. <clears throat> uh, when a person is typically booked into the jail, the fingerprints are obtained on everybody that is, is booked in. Um, and those are just basic fingerprints. Sometimes they need what they refer to as major case prints. And the major case prints would uh, include additional areas of the finger that contains friction ridge that is normally not collected um, during the broken process. 
So basically those major case prints would include the sides of each finger. That is or correct. Or the rolling print. That is correct. Um, and for the record, do you see the person whose fingerprints you collected in the courtroom? I'll ask before the witness answers for everyone outside of the jury box to lower their mask for a few moments so that the witness can see everyone's face. Go ahead and replace your masks, please. Do you see Chandler yep. Halderson? Yes, I do. Could you please identify him by where he's seated and perhaps the color of his shirt? Uh, he is seated to the table to my right. He's wearing a uh, dark sports coat and appears to be a dark tie with a light colored shirt. I would ask the record to reflect the witnesses identified the defendant. It shall. Could you please identify what is marked as his exhibit 362? These are uh, fingerprints that were obtained during a uh, search warrant of Mr. Halderson. Um, and those are the prints that you collected? Yes, they are. And th these are those rolling prints? Correct. At this time, I would move exhibit 362 into evidence. No objection. They are received. Deputy, what was your primary task in this investigation? Well, the primary task in this investigation is the uh, evaluation of the crime scene, the documentation of the crime scene, um, the collection of the evidence, and the uh, preservation of the evidence so that could be later tested uh, if need be. And specifically, were you basically in charge of the search at the 4595 Oak Springs Circle address in Dane yep. County, Wisconsin? Yes, I was. Just generally, how do you process a crime scene such as an, a complete single family home? Well, the process of the crime scene, although it may sound simple, is, is pretty complex. Um, and it, it takes a number of, of, of different things uh, for that to be accomplished. Um, and one person obviously cannot do that all by themselves. And I had significant help from uh, Deputy James Plenty and Deputy Eric Schneider, as well as uh, members of this Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory field response and the uh, Wisconsin Department of uh, Criminal Investigations Arson Response Unit. Um, What's the first thing you do when you enter a home to begin a search? Well, the first thing is we're, we're taking photographs um, and we're evaluating and getting a better understanding as to what had occurred at the, uh, at the scene. I think you described to me that at first you guys walk around quiet. That is correct. Tell um, us about that. What I like to do, and it's worked for me over the years, um, I learned this from my predecessor, that when we go into the crime scene, whether I'm with my partner Jim Plenty or with Eric Schneider, um, that we take everything in, we take our notes in with us, but when I say we take everything is um, we don't talk to each other. We evaluate the entire scene and we don't talk to each other because we don't want to taint each other's mind. Um, each person may see things a little bit differently um, so I found it's best that uh, we, we walk through the scene, evaluate the scene, and then after we've done a complete walk through the scene and we've done our evaluation, then we talk amongst each other. And we're not only um, getting understanding as to what each other has seen, but we're also forming a game plan as to how we were going to process this thing and what additional resources we may need to uh, call in. So that first time that you guys walk through in silence helps you map out a game plan. That for is correct. Specifics. And I've referred to it um, as, as like a golden hour. It, it takes a significant amount of time to go through a, a house as large as that. And you said you photograph the whole area. That is correct. Now, let me ask you, when you guys are walking around, um, are you, do you wear anything special to assist you? Oh, absolutely. We, well, 
we are we're getting an understanding as to what has occurred at the scene, and by doing so, um, we we have to walk throughout the scene. So we wear booties and we wear gloves. Uh, in addition, obviously, we would have flashlights um, to help us look uh, in areas to illuminate. Uh, that aren't well lit. And it doesn't matter if there's lights in the room or not, we still would have our flashlights with us. And you're doing your best to take in the scene without potentially disturbing it. Correct. Um, we refer to that as minimizing contamination. No matter what you try to do, you, you are going to contaminate the scene by entering and walking around. There's no way about it. We cannot float through space. Um, but we minimize the contamination um, so it does take a while for us to get through the scene. It's, it is a process. It's a, a systematic approach. Um, you just can't be walking haphazard through the scene. Um, again, we're, we're relying that, on that scene to get us information, um, so we have to take everything in. All right, and Deputy, I'm going to show you some exhibits. And I'm going to have you briefly look through them. And these are exhibits 176 through 302, as well as 551 and 552. Just gonna have you briefly peruse those. Just let me know when you're finished. And if I could have HDMI left, I have it on a blink. And at, oh, sorry. <laughs> As a group deputy, how would you describe the photos, the exhibits that are up there? These are photographs of the interior of uh, 4595 Oak Springs Circle in the village of Windsor, Wisconsin. And um, as exhibits, do they appear to be true and accurate depictions of what you observed on the scene? Yes, they are. All right, so at this time I would move exhibits 176 through 193, 195 through 205, 204 through 218, 220 through 225, 
227 through 248, 252 through 278, 292 through 302, as well as 551 and 552 and 310 through 312 into evidence. Any objection? No objection. Those are all received and may be published. Okay. All right. So Deputy, just to begin with, how would you describe the Halderson home just in general? I would describe the overall condition of the house um, to be half finished and half in state of repair. Um, it appeared to be um, some renovations occurring with inside of the residence, um, yeah, and they were still living within the house, so then there were areas that were completed uh, with the renovations. Did that pose any challenges to you and your team during the search? Nothing significant, um, no. Okay. All right, and I'm Exhibit 176. How would you describe Exhibit 176? Exhibit 176 is a photograph of the living room, which I call on the main level of the residence. And we are looking to the west in the far left corner. There's the entrance door to the residence. Um, that is uh, um, just above grade. Um, directly in the middle of the photo, there's uh, a set of stairs that ascend up to the upper level. The stairs uh, go up to what I refer to as the bedroom level. Uh, the house is of a tri-level construction, um, so then uh, there'll be an area that descends to the uh, lower living room, family room area, and then yet again, there'll be a basement as well. Can I see counsel with the, uh, yes, absolutely. the sidebar for a brief moment? Exhibit 178, what is Exhibit 178? Uh, that is a photograph of the west wall of the same room. I'm sorry, that is the east wall of the same room that we were just in. Uh, we're just looking at the, uh, the fireplace. Uh, that is a uh, gas sealed fireplace. And a fireplace becomes significant in this case. Yes, it does. Is this the fireplace that became of any significance? No, it is not. Just in general, did the living room have any significant, significant evidentiary value? No, it did not. Okay. Moving on, what does Exhibit 177 display? Exhibit 177 is a photograph in the same living room. It is from the uh, southeast corner and now we're able to look out towards the north and there's the dining room. And this is actually exhibit nine, an exhibit that we've seen earlier. Um, but what is exhibit nine display? This is a photograph of the dining room and now we're able to see a portion of the kitchen that is to the northwest of this room. And again, did the dining room have any significant evidentiary value to your investigation? No, it did not. What is Exhibit 179? 179 is a photograph that is taken from the doorway between uh, the living room and uh, the kitchen. This is the kitchen area. So standing at this doorway and looking to the north, 
uh, we can see an, an exit door on the north side. And directly behind me, uh, or opposing this, would be the entrance to the residence. So that door there, um, does that go into the backyard or to somewhere else? That opens up into the backyard. There's a uh, set of stairs uh, that descend down to the west. Okay. All right. Um, was there anything really of note in your investigation in the kitchen? No, there was not. Uh, exhibit 180, what do you, what is seen there? This is the stairwell uh, leading up to the uh, second level or the bedroom level. And to the left in this photograph would be the, uh, the front door. And then to the right would be to the, uh, to the kitchen. And there's some blue tape that it appears above a light switch in exhibit 180. Was that there when you arrived on scene or is that part of your all of these photographs are how we found the scene okay. uh, this is an initial walkthrough we have not done anything at this point uh, so that is not from us that was that was artifact from whoever had placed that there previously okay. how would you describe 181 181 is a photograph at the top of the stairs facing to the west uh, we can see an open door in the uh, right portion of the photograph and then there are two doors to the left on the left side of this. What you can't see abound around to the right is a, a another door uh, to a bathroom. And then if you were to button hook around the corner to the right in this photograph, there's another bedroom. Uh, exhibit 182, how would you describe it? This is a photograph of the first room on the left that I referred to in the previous photograph. This is the doorway that opens up into the uh, laundry room. This room appears to be under renovation. Um, there's a lot of supplies in this room for uh, insulation. Uh, there's some flooring in this room as well. And it appears that the, uh, the plywood flooring on the floor um, is, has been put down uh, as part of the renovation. 183, please describe it. This is the same laundry room. Uh, this would be in the southwest corner of the laundry room. Uh, it appears to be a, uh, a makeshift um, area where one would uh, have their toiletry items and uh, uh, stuff you would normally find in a bathroom. 184, more the same there? That is correct, yes. 185, just a different view? That is correct, yes. 186. This is a uh, photograph of a toothbrush that was located on the makeshift vanity, if you will, um, that was later collected as evidence. And why was this toothbrush head collected? The Toothbrush was collected as a DNA source uh, for uh, what we believe to be Krista Halderson. Uh, most of the inf most of the items that were in that area um, were uh, consistent with what a woman would have in in their uh, uh, bathroom area. So we could assume that that was from uh, Krista Halderson. And Krista was in fact the only female residing at that location to my knowledge that is correct okay. i'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit 194 no need to glove up i'm not going to ask you to open it but can you tell from stickers from your office and perhaps initials what exhibit 194 is uh, exhibit 194 has been marked with evidence number 41748 it is an electric toothbrush head um, that was collected and had subsequent, subsequently um, gone and been submitted to the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory as their, their stickers are fixed on here as well. Okay. I would move exhibit 194 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received.
What does uh, Exhibit 187 display? 187 is a photograph of the floor in the laundry room area. Uh, specifically, we can see there are two uh, numerical, I'm sorry, alpha markers on the floor uh, that have been placed by items of evidence. And of course, I am the one who arranged the photos. So these photos were taken after you had put down some placards. That is correct. And what is Exhibit 188? Exhibit 188 is a uh, reddish brown stain that has been marked with the letter A in the laundry room on the floor. 189, the same but with the letter B? That is correct. What is Exhibit 190 display? 190 is a photograph in that same uh, laundry room. Uh, this is, uh, if you were to break the room in half, if you will, um, there was a washer and dryer in the previous photographs. There is a wall that, that separates the room. Um, and there's a, uh, a vacuum cleaner in this photograph, as well as some insulation and uh, some flooring boards, it was what it appears to be. 191. This is the vacuum cleaner that I collected from uh, the bathroom. And why was the vacuum cleaner collected? During the uh, evaluation portion of the processing of the crime scene, I identified that uh, there was blood on the side of the vacuum cleaner. And I had further tested that blood um, with phenolphthalein, which gives us a presumptive positive for blood. Um, under the appearance, they appeared to be blood, but we need to confirm those stains, so we confirm those stains with phenolphthalein. Then I use a subsequent test yet again, and it's called the hexagon OBTI test. This test uh, differentiates uh, between human and non-human blood. And that, that test was positive. For human blood or non-human blood? For positive for human blood. So the first test you do is phenolphthalein, and is that just like a chemical that you apply to a swab or something else? Correct. So we take a swab and we uh, uh, put a drop of sterile water on the swab to collect a portion of that, of that stain. And then we uh, use the phenolphthalein solution, uh, placing a drop onto the swab, followed by a... Uh, uh, another chemical on top of that. And when it turns to a, a bright purple color um, almost instantly, that's an indicator that uh, the presence of, of blood. And then you perform a second test. To say, Correct. Is this now we human don't, or is this something else? Correct. Now we don't do that on, on, on every stain um, that we collect. We don't do the second test. Um, the second test differentiates between human and non-human blood. And why do you sometimes not do the second test? It depends if, uh, you know, if it's in an area where there's a concentration of, of stains um, and they can all be from, potentially be from the same source. Uh, it is a tool that we utilize um, in order to be uh, more effective in, in getting evidence tested at the crime lab. We're, we're limited in the number of items that we can submit to the crime lab. We cannot submit every everything that we collect. Um, so this is a screening tool that we utilize um, in order to help us um, look at the best probative value of that piece of evidence. Um, so if we, we collect a stain but we don't know what it is, um, we basically could be wasting somebody's time at the crime lab. Whereas if we're able to do the phenolphthalein test followed by the hexagon OBTI test, um, then we're, we're, we're basically uh, utilizing the resources to the best of our ability. Moving on to exhibit 192, what is exhibit 192? This is the side of the vacuum cleaner that was in that same laundry room. It's marked with letter E. 193. Is the same photograph. Um, it, we put numerical markers in there indicating the uh, 
individual stains that were collected from the uh, side of the vacuum cleaner. Now, is it fair to say when you are looking at this scene, you don't necessarily know everything else that's occurring in the investigation? Is that fair? That is that is fair. Um, however, we do we do rely on on communication. Um, the, success, the success of any investigation when it relates to the crime scene investigators and the detectives um, involves communication. We, we are guided by information that we're getting from them. And additionally, we are providing information outside of the scene uh, because they don't know everything that's going on inside the scene, just like we don't know everything that's happening outside of the scene. And is it fair to say that sometimes you might think something is... Uh, evidence of something and then learn another fact later on and it has an innocent explanation? Absolutely. Exhibit 10. Please describe Exhibit 10 for the jury. Exhibit 10 is a photograph of the bedroom that would be in the southwest corner of the bedroom level. This would be the doorway that was beyond the laundry room door on the same side of that hallway. Uh, looking in here, this is the bedroom of Chandler Halverson. Um, exhibit 11, another view of Mr. Halderson's bedroom? Correct. This is a view from the entrance facing to the north, uh, I'm sorry, to the west and to the uh, southwest. Could you describe exhibit 195? This is the bedroom of Bart and Krista Halderson. This is in the northwest corner of the residence on the bedroom level. And was there much um, that you found in their bedroom that was of evidentiary value to you? No, there was not. How would you describe Exhibit 196? Exhibit 196 is a photograph of a, what I would call a spear bedroom. This would be the bedroom that um, I refer to as button hooking around the corner. So this, on the bedroom level, this would be in the northeast corner. And again, was there much evidence collected from this room? No, there was not. Describe exhibit, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put in the, 551, please. Exhibit 551 um, is a photograph of the room that is between the uh, bedroom of Bart and Krista Halderson in the northwest corner and the previous photo of that spear bedroom. This room is between the two of them. So the wall to the right would butt up against the, uh, the wall of that spear bedroom. Uh, this is uh, a bathroom that is under um, renovation. And this is exhibit 552. Why did you take this picture? Well, I had previously been out to the crime scene at Irwin Road and was uh, aware that there was a Rubbermaid rolling storage garbage type bin that was at that scene. And I saw that this cover was consistent with a cover that would fit that type of rolling garbage bin. Um, mind you, this photograph was, was uh, taken after the initial walkthrough. And I had also saw in the uh, uh, garage area there is a, another refuse container consistent with appearance of the, the same Rubbermaid rolling storage garbage bin. And the exhibits we've looked at, is that the entire bedroom level? Are there any more rooms left? There are no, long, there are no more rooms on that level. There is a attic crawl space um, above the entrance to the bathroom. And did you search that? That was searched as well. Anything of any evidentiary value found in the attic crawl space? No, there was not. Exhibit 197. What is Exhibit 197? Exhibit 197 is the doorway opening to the bathroom. This is on the uh, family room slash office level. 
Uh, also located on this same level would be access to the garage. So this level is at grade. Um, this is this the same level as the kitchen and dining room? No, it is not. This okay. is down one level. So we, we enter into the house through the front door, and that is the, the, the main level, if you will. And we ascend up the stairs to the left or to the west, and that's the bedroom level. As I spoke earlier of the photograph of the back door to the kitchen, and I referred to the front door being directly behind me, if I was to turn to the left and look down, I would have another set of stairs that would descend down into the, uh, the family room, office, and garage level. Exhibit 16, how would you describe Exhibit 16? This is a photograph of the, uh, the shower that's within the bathroom. Anything of note at all in the bathroom? In the bathroom, there were uh, stains uh, that were blood stains that were on the baseboard. And uh, you, you called them blood. Does that mean you did the phenolphthalein test? I did not do the phenolphthalein test on those. Uh, crime scene investigator okay. Deputy uh, Jim Plenty did the uh, test on those. And you guys often rely on each other's work being partners. Yes, we do. Moving on to Exhibit 546. Could you please describe Exhibit 546? Exhibit 546 is a photograph of what I refer to as the office area. Uh, as you can see in the near portion on the left side of this image, there is a, a wall. If, uh, if we were standing at that wall and went around the corner, we would look, be looking straight at the entrance to the bathroom. So. Uh, the bathroom is is just to the left and beyond uh, this office area. Okay. And is this a photo, if you know, um, before you search the area and move things around after or something else? This photograph was taken prior to any any processing or anything being done. And there was some items of note found in this area. Is that fair to say? That is correct, yes. Um, and in uh, collecting and photographing, um, is it fair to say you moved some of the paperwork? Yes. Okay. So in Exhibit 543, um, there appears, uh, how would you describe Exhibit 543? Exhibit 543 is a, a stack of papers and binders that were under the monitor that were on the desk. Okay. And that's before you moved items again? That is correct. Okay. Um, and then 198, how would you describe Exhibit 198? These were photographs that were taken after uh, the search of this area. Okay. And... Exhibit 543, there's an item there circled. Um, is that fair to say? That is correct. It's a piece of paper that um, had writings on it and appeared to me to be consistent with um, access codes or passwords. Um, again, not knowing the relevance or importance of it, uh, we just simply just photographed it. And to photograph it, you moved it? That is correct, yes. And that's Exhibit 198? Yes. I'm going to approach you with Exhibit 203. What is Exhibit 203? Exhibit 203 um, is the actual documents that I had photographed. Um, they're basically written in uh, pen and pencil. Uh, there's some typed um, login information is what I, I, I refer to them as. So basically every IT person's worst nightmare, a list of passwords. Absolutely. And can you just look at this briefly? Um, and some of the, before some of them, it says you, like username. Is that fair to say? There's a U before? Yes, it appears to have a U 
which I would assume would be username, and then below it there's a P, which I would assume to be password. And I just want you to look roughly how many passwords are on these sheets of paper in Exhibit 203. There's a back? There's a back. Um, I would suggest that there is no less than 45 to 50, as some of them appear to have been crossed out, and there are additional writings um, around the outside border of this document as well. And is Exhibit 203 in the same or substantially same condition as it was when you collected it from the Halderson desk? Yes, it is. Although I was not the work person that collected it, um, I was present at the time that it was collected. Fair enough. At this time, I would move Exhibit 203 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Based on the paperwork you went through and the totality of the desk area, could you tell whose desk it was? There was a, uh, a computer that was there. Um, it was um, uh, had a business card on it for a financial company uh, in Middleton. Um, and I, I came to the conclusion that that was the desk and office area for Bart Halderson. And were you made aware during the investigation that he had been working from home like many people during 2021? Yes, I was. I was aware of that. And Exhibit 546, um, what is the red circled area in 546? I believe that's around the documents that uh, were collected. And there's kind of one highlighted there in a screenshot from 543, which again was the video from the home um, that was previously play played for the jury. Is that a fair description? Yes. And did you specifically move a document there that document to, to be on top of the keyboard to photograph it? I did not specifically move that, although it was moved there so that it could be photographed, yes. Sure, by one of the other members of the crime scene. That is correct. And is that common to move items to aid in photography? Absolutely. Um, but you are sure to document where it originally was first, is that, that fair? Is, that is correct as well. Exhibit 201, is that a further picture of that document? Yes, it is. Just the top page, right? Deputy, I'm going to approach you with Exhibit 202. How would you describe Exhibit 202? Exhibit 202 is the actual uh, document that was previously uh, shown on the screen, the photograph. Uh, it's an email uh, which appears to be from Krista Halderson uh, to a person named Bart. Um, and the subject matter says Madison College. And the back side, it looks like the uh, a letter uh, to Mr. Chandler Halderson from Citizens Bank. And does this appear to be in the same condition as you saw it in the home? Yes, it is. At this time, I would move Exhibit 202 into evidence. Actually, Your Honor, can we approach? Of course.
Admitted. Over objection, the uh, evidence is received into evidence. And I would ask permission to publish to the jury. And you may. All right. I'd actually like to pass this one around if that's Certainly. okay. Council, we have to, to straighten out one exhibit number. You can continue passing that document, but we'll use up the time to.
Exhibit 204. Exhibit 204 is a uh, photograph specific to the uh, gray and white object, which is a, a Google uh, Play device. Is it the Google version of an Alexa, basically? That is my understanding, correct, yes. I believe it's called the Google Nest? That is correct, yes. Why was this picture taken? Well, in the overall uh, totality of everything, um, I saw that all of the uh, cords were plugged into one central area. However, the cord that would plug into the outlet to, to power all of these uh, was unplugged. So there was no power to the desk, if you will, which is where a number of these items were getting uh, the electricity from. Were there any other Google Nests throughout the home? Yes, there was. Were In it, the main it? entry level living room, when you enter in through the front door, there was a Google device on the north wall of the living room. Uh, that Google device was unplugged. There was also a Google device that was located in the basement area, and that Google device was also unplugged. Was that significant to you at all? It was. It drew attention because I uh, recalled a previous case out of the state of Arkansas where uh, there was a motion in a trial there to attempt to get uh, any information that that listening device could have recorded, um, not just what was said when the wake-up word is used. Uh, so I thought it might have had some significance. That's why I photographed it. And one additional question about the desk area. Was there a phone charger located on the desk area? Yes, there, there was a phone charger. Um, and if I recall, it was for like an iPhone. Okay. Judge, this might be a good lunch stopping point. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we will return at 1 o'clock which gives you an hour and 10 minutes. I know there's some things that we will take care of in your absence. Um, as always, don't spend any time while you're away from this room discussing this case with anyone or overhearing any discussions or taking any steps purposely or avoid any steps unintentionally of being exposed to any information about the case. And we'll see everyone at 1 o'clock. All right. Can you hear it? Good morning, everyone. My name is James Langer. I am the digital content manager for Channel3000.com. As you just heard, uh, they are taking their daily lunch break right now in day five of the Chandler Halderson trial. They expect to be back at about 1 p.m. Central Time here in Madison. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to hop on here and kind of give a recap of what we've heard so far today, just in case you are joining us a little bit late or you might have missed some parts of the morning session that started at about 8 45. Uh, just gonna get you all caught up here before we take that lunch break as well. So so far today um, obviously day five we are starting the second full week or second week of this trial I guess first full week um, if you want to discount jury selection last Monday uh, and the prosecution is still laying out their case. What we've seen today is, is more physical evidence in the courtroom. Um, than we've seen in previous days of this trial. Whereas, you know, the first few days we've seen uh, lots of photos and, and things of that nature from detective searches, we're starting to see the physical items presented to the jury as well as the prosecutors uh, start to build their case out a little bit more. So uh, this morning, what we heard uh, were from some deputies and, and other members of the uh, Dane County Sheriff's Office who had searched both the farm property and Cottage Grove where Bart Holderson's remains were found, as well as the Holderson home itself. And uh, we're starting to see some more images of, of tours around the house and that kind of thing. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, um, let's start with what they found at the farm in Cottage Grove. So we heard from a uh, number of sheriff's office officials there who had helped conduct in the ground search after uh, Bart Halderson's remains were found there on July 8th. And um, so among the things that they found were a couple of 
I guess the best way to describe them would be cutting instruments or tools inside an oil drum that were found near where the remains were found, including a variety of saw blades, scissors, that kind of thing. So uh, those were collected into evidence, and uh, as we saw this morning, they actually unboxed those pieces of evidence and, and showed the physical pieces to the jury in the room so they could see up close as well. Uh, among the other things they found were um, some tarps in, in uh, a garbage bin. Some of it had um, what they believed to be maybe some blood on it or, or a thing of that nature. Um, so they took that into evidence as well. Um, one of the points of contention, I guess you could call it, in, in the morning session was the uh, discovery of the rifle that was found in the shed on that farm property. Of course, as we learned last week, that rifle wasn't found in the July searches. It wasn't found until October, many months later, when the, the property owner was, was cleaning out her shed there. She found it kind of propped up against the wall, buried a bunch uh, behind a, a pile of boards uh, propped up against the wall as well. So that gun wasn't found in, uh, until October. Uh, it, it's consistent with uh, what prosecutors think may be the gun used to kill Bart Halderson. Uh, Bart Holderson's severed torso had a gunshot wound in the back, um, if you remember that testimony from last week. So what the defense did in cross-examination was really kind of question the sheriff's office officials on why this might have been missed in the original go-around. They did a walkthrough of the, of the shed originally with a cadaver dog before kind of going into an official search a couple days later uh, with a handful of, of deputies and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but the gun wasn't turned up in that July search. It wasn't turned up until October. So the sheriff's office kind of had to ad answer some tough questions on how they might have missed this piece of uh, what's believed to be key evidence here uh, for several months. And, and they basically said, you know, we're, we did the best that we could. We believe we conducted a thorough search, but it, it's always possible in searches for either human error or, or something else that sometimes we, we don't find everything all of the time. And, um, so the defense kind of hammered home on that point of, you know, there, there was nobody from the sheriff's office kind of guarding that location from that time that they released it back to the landowner until October, they don't know how the gun got there, basically. They can't say for sure that the gun was there in July either. So that's that's kind of the point the defense was making on that rifle that was found there. Um, after that, we, we moved more onto a focus of the Halderson home search uh, overall, and we heard from some sheriff's office officials who uh, conducted the searches there in in the days after the arrest, and uh, specifically what they found in the garage were a, a pile of shoes. Where you know, not uncommon, uncommon. A lot of families kind of keep their shoes in the garage, especially if it's an attached garage into the home, that kind of thing. Uh, what they found was a pair of athletic shoes that appeared to have some uh, what they believed to be blood spots on them. It was a reddish or brownish staining on the sole of the pair of shoes uh, and and on the tongue of the shoe as well, right below where you would lace it up. And basically they were looking at shoes because the crime lab had found some footprints on some of the tarps that were found on the Cottage Grove property and they wanted to check for footprints and see if there were any shoes that, that might have matched. So they went through basically this giant pile of shoes in, in the garage and um, they found this shoe that appeared to have some blood stains on it, also some grassy residue on it, that kind of thing. Um, but while they were also digging around in this pile of shoes, they found a pair of shoes that was kind of tucked away uh, underneath a, a storage rack, basically, in the garage. And inside that shoe, they found a foil wrap package. So investigators took pictures of that foil package, and then as they unraveled it, they found the driver's licenses of Bart and Krista Halderson hidden in that shoe, as well as two cell phones. Um, so that was a pretty big uh, piece of, of, of revealing evidence in the prosecution's case here, that they had the IDs and the cell phones of Bart and Krista Halderson hidden, apparently, in a shoe inside the Halderson home. Uh, if you remember Chandler's story to police was that he got a message, text message from his mom from her phone uh, the weekend that they 
had disappeared, allegedly telling him that they had made it to the cabin safe and they were going to a 4th of July party. Of course, authorities found that nobody was at the Holderson's cabin that weekend. Um, so now the question is, how did Chandler get that text message if the phones were found in the Holderson home uh, that week? So uh, be sure to look out for that as, as we kind of go through here too. Um, we also heard from investigators, they took a DNA sample from Chandler Holderson. We haven't heard yet where his DNA may have been found on um, any of the items that we've heard about so far, but the prosecution seems to be building up to something to that effect as well. So, um, so far we've seen a lot of testimony on the other parts tour of the Holderson home. We're kind of in stopping in the middle of that tour um, as described by Deputy Greg Leatherberry, the Dane County Sheriff's Office. He kind of going through in painstaking detail the photos that they took of every single room in that house as they walked through um, and, and things of interest that they had found. So they, among the things that he's mentioned so far, uh, they collected a toothbrush they believe to belong to Krista Halderson for DNA purposes. They found a vacuum cleaner. They collected that for evidence because blood was so found on the side of that vacuum. And they did a bunch of uh, tests on the blood at the scene they were able to confirm it was human blood found on the side of the vacuum. We don't know yet whose blood it was, but the presence of human blood there caused them to send that into the state crime lab for testing as well. Um, so a, a lot of these things now where we're starting to get more of these pieces of evidence, whereas you know last week we heard a lot more about relationships with the defendant and, and Barton Krista Halderson and some of the um, events leading up to their disappearance and some of the descriptions of his demeanor at the time, now we're kind of getting more into the uh, actual physical evidence of everything. So be sure to stay tuned in this afternoon for all of those um, as they continue with this line of questioning. As we mentioned, they believe that they'll be back in session at about one o'clock uh, this afternoon after the lunch break. So uh, be sure to tune in then. In the meantime, we're going to work on a recap of everything I just kind of covered here over at channel3000.com. And a reminder, as always, that you can go to our uh, Chandler Halderson trial page at channel3000.com slash Halderson. You see the URL on the screen now. That link's also in the description of these live streams live streams so you can uh, go and click that link and uh, check out that page for anything you've missed over the last week if you're just diving into this trial as we're heading into week two that's a good place to go to kind of get the the notes of the previous four or five days there we have all those links on that page we also have a timeline of events we've got this live stream video so you can read through those things while listening in so you don't have to miss anything today uh, it's just a great resource to go to if you want to catch up on this trial and stay up to date if you miss any of these live streams as well. So with that in mind, we're going to sign off here. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have these recaps up on channel3000.com as well. Also be sure to watch our newscasts tonight, News 3 Now, uh, at 4, 5, and 6 for more recaps on, on what happened inside the courtroom um, if you missed any of this today. So uh, with that, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll sign off um, until the lunch hour is over. Again, 1 p.m. or so is, is when they think they'll be back. So we will see you guys then. Have a good one.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Langer. I'm the digital content manager for Channel3000.com. Uh, we are still waiting for the jury to return from their lunch break here in day five of the Chandler Halderson homicide trial. They broke for lunch uh, about an hour ago. The judge had said that they anticipated being back around 1 p.m. Central Time. Of course, it's about 1.05 Central Time right now um, and, and still no sign of everybody. So I'm just going to hop on here again and kind of recap what we heard uh, in testimony this morning, just in case if you're joining us for the afternoon session or, you know, if you've been working or just keeping an ear on things and may have missed something uh, in the early part of today. So uh, we started today with more testimony from several members of the Dane County Sheriff's Office, uh, some deputies, a lieutenant, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of people who were involved in the searches of both the Chandler Halderson home in Windsor, as well as the property out in Cottage Grove, Wisconsin, uh, where Bart Halderson's remains were eventually found. So we, we heard some testimony from the people who were walking those grounds in the days after uh, Bart's remains were found and, and heard about some of the other things that they found on that property, including a bunch of uh, cutting utensils, that kind of thing, like saw blades and, and scissors, that sort of thing, found inside an oil drum not far from where Bart's body was found. Um, they sent all those in for testing, that kind of thing. And, and a change of what we've seen compared to last week, now that we're in the second week of the trial, we saw a lot more uh, physical evidence uh, being shown to the jury. So they actually brought out those items. Uh, they were all boxed up after they were sent to the crime lab and tested and, and all that stuff. But they took everything out of the box today and, and had deputies put gloves on, obviously, and, and show jurors up close what these items look like and, and what they found on the these uh, crime scenes. So, like I mentioned, there were, there were those cutting utensils, but there were also uh, some pieces of tarp that were found in the Cottage Grove farm site where investigators found a piece of tarp folded up inside the shed on that property. They unfolded it a bit saw some red stains that they believed to be blood, so they quickly kind of repackaged that and sent that off for testing again uh, to see if they could confirm whose blood was on those tarps found, again, in that shed not too far from where Bart's body was found. Uh, what they didn't find, at least in those July searches, was the gun. Uh, as we heard last week, the owner of that property testified she was cleaning out the shed in October, so several months later, um, three, four months later when she came across this stack of uh, boards that was unusual to her, that she didn't know were there. She kind of looked behind the boards and what she saw was a gun, this SKS uh, model rifle that we've heard was a, a favorite model of Chandler's. It's similar to the gun that a friend bought for him just a few weeks before this is all allegedly went down. So this gun was found in the shed in October, but Obviously, the defense had a lot of questions for the deputies who were on scene about why they didn't uncover this in July. They had multiple people inside the shed kind of looking through everything. They obviously found other pieces of evidence, as we mentioned, that tarp and a few other things. But uh, what they did not find in July was the gun. And so the defense wanted to know why. You know, obviously, uh, in their mind, in their case, they're trying to maybe plant some doubt in when this gun got here, because if it wasn't discovered in July, uh, there, who's to say, their argument is who's to say where this gun came from or if, if it was even there in July. So um, that was a key point of conflict this morning uh, between the defense and, and uh, the investigators who were on the stand. What we also heard was testimony from investigators who were uh, at the scene of the Halderson home and what they found in the garage in terms of shoes. So they, they wanted to look at shoes because the crime lab had come back to them and said uh, that they were finding some footprints on the, on the tarp. So they wanted to get some shoe prints and photos of shoes and that kind of thing. Um, so they, they took some pictures of some shoes. They found a pair of athletic shoes that appeared to have uh, red drops or stains on them 
they believe the investigators believe that was blood so they had that sent in as well we don't know for sure whose shoes those belong to uh, but they were an athletic type of shoe they also found another pair of shoes with floral prints on them that was kind of hidden away from the rest kind of tucked under uh, the storage shelf if you want to call it that in the garage and inside that shoe they actually found a foil wrapped package if you want to call it that uh, they just a, a wrap up of foil and when investigators looked inside they found uh, this Wisconsin State driver's licenses of Barton Krista Halderson they found two cell phones in there as well so uh, apparently somebody had tried to hide the IDs and the phones of Barton Krista Halderson inside the home there of course you'll remember earlier Chandler Halderson had claimed to authorities that he'd gotten a text from his mom, Krista, during that 4th of July weekend, claiming that they had gotten to the cabin safe and they were going to a 4th of July parade. Uh, so we don't know uh, when that text was sent or, or where, where it was sent from. We just know that investigators found these cell phones inside the Halderson home. Uh, so prosecutors clearly focusing on that aspect as well. Uh, so where we left off with lunch, we were hearing from a deputy from the Dane County Sheriff's Office kind of going room by room through the Halderson home of what they found uh, when they went through each room. Some rooms, they found no nothing of evidentiary value, as they call it. They found no evidence in a lot of those rooms. In other rooms, they found uh, blood prints, that kind of thing. So uh, we'll hear more in this afternoon session, I'm sure, uh, of what else they found in the home at that time so uh that's kind of where we stand right now the jury it looks like is coming back in for the afternoon session so with that i will uh sign off here and we will take you back to the trial live for the afternoon session i'll be back when they come to this mid-afternoon break to kind of recap what we've heard since then uh but in the meantime, if you want to get more details, I threw a link in the comments of these live streams of our morning update, everything that I just kind of recapped here, so you can read through that as well as you keep an ear on the afternoon session here. Uh, so here's court as the jury is back in. Thanks, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, was there anyone over the break who was exposed to any information about the case, sought information, had discussions, participated, or in involuntarily overheard discussions? I see no hands. Thank you. Very good. We'll resume with the testimony from Detective uh, Deputy Leatherberry. I'll remind you, you're still under the oath that you swore this morning. If you would proceed, Attorney Raymond. Could you try turning the HDMI on and then off? I mean, off. Five is? Exhibit 205 is a photograph taken from the east side of the office level, if you will, facing towards uh, the west. It is the doorway that leads out into the garage area. And what is Exhibit 25? This is a photograph of the interior of the garage. The door that was in the previous photograph would be adjacent to the two refuse containers that are in the left uh, portion of that image. And are the vehicles that are in the garage, um, the Volvo belonging to Krista Halderson and the Subaru belonging to Bart Halderson? That is correct, yes. What is Exhibit 207 a picture of? Exhibit 207 is a photograph that's depicting the Rubbermaid wheeled refuse uh, container. Um, and is that container um, 
consistent with the container found in the woods at the Earlwyn Drive property? This is the container that I referred to earlier in my testimony when we were uh, speaking to the lid that was in the uh, bathroom on the bedroom level that was under construction. Um, this is the lid with the refuse container and it's consistent with the same type of refuse container that was found in the woods uh, out on Irwin property. And I'm, I'm sorry, part of your testimony might be a little confusing. Is this the same lid that was upstairs in the bathroom? No, it is not the same lid. This is uh, the lid that goes with this container. There are two lids, apparent, then there would be two lids within that side of the house. Exhibit 208, what is that a picture of? This is a photograph depicting um, the two refuse containers that uh, are provided by uh, a municipality for, for picking up of waste. Uh, one is a recycle bin with the blue lid and the other one is the trash container. And did you test um, or to perform any evidentiary test on any of these garbage cans? I did. On the handle of the uh, garbage can, uh, there was reddish brown stain. Uh, There's also reddish brown stains on the inside of the uh, container. The stain that was on the handle um, was tested with phenolphthalein, which was uh, presumptive positive, and then followed up with the uh, hexagon OBTI test, which was also positive for human blood. Could you describe exhibit 209 for the jury? This is a photograph of the interior side of the west wall of the garage. This would be in the southwest corner. In this image, there is a placard with the number seven uh, that is indicating that the, uh, the metal framed gray basket that is hanging and the items that are inside of that basket. And the seven was put there by police? Yes, I put that there. And Exhibit 210, what does 210 show? Exhibit 210 shows uh, another photograph of the same bin. However, the, uh, the first uh, container that was on top of it has been removed to expose a couple lengths of rope. You see a length of rope that is black in color and there's also a length of rope that is orange in color. And why did you note the rope? The black rope is consistent in appearance with a rope that was around the torso of the deceased that was located on the Irwin Road property. 211, again, just a close-up of that rope. It's showing the, uh, the cut end of that rope. And if you want to glove up, Deputy, I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 279. Uh, exhibit 279, does it have uh, a sticker from your department with a label? Yes, it does. It is a uh, evidence ID number 41887, and it's the black rope from the garage basket. I'd ask that you open up the bag. State will move Exhibit 279 into evidence. Any objection? It is received. It may be shown. Yeah. Any 
if you just want to hold that up, maybe stand up and hold it up for the jury. Exhibit 279. Was the, what appears like tape, was that present when you collected it? No, it was not. Is that something done by the crime lab? That was done by myself. Okay. Why? It was done by myself in preparation for submitting the cut end to the state crime laboratory for comparison. And specifically... What is Exhibit 280? Exhibit 280 is a cut section from 41887, the evidence ID number. And that is the portion of the rope that you cut and submitted, and it was submitted to the state crime lab? That is correct. At this point, I would move Exhibit 280 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Would you like me to? Actually, I don't think. It's a cutting from the previous rope that was seen. And then just to move in for the record, Exhibit 281, how would you describe Exhibit 281? Exhibit 281 is an evidence bag sealed with evidence tape with evidence ID number 41993, which is the cut rope from evidence ID number 41692, which is the cut, uh, the rope, portion that was around the torso. And I would move exhibit 281 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Deputy, could you describe Exhibit 222 to the jury, please? This is a photograph, again, of the interior side of the west wall of the garage. The previous photograph would have been to the left of this on that same wall. In this photograph, we can see the, uh, the window, and below the window, uh, there are some, some green uh, stakes that are leading up against the lower left corner of that window. Okay. 223, can you describe Exhibit 223? In Exhibit 223, we can see those same green stakes as a reference from the previous photograph. And we can see a golf club that is against uh, the wall. And just to the left of the black head of the golf club, uh, there's a number indicator uh, for uh, an item evidence that was collected. 212, what does Exhibit 212 display? 212 is a better photograph depicting the evidence marker number eight. Number eight is for the wooden handle that is attached to the axe head uh, that is on the floor of the garage. Please describe 213. 213 is a photograph of the axe that I collected from the garage. And just to back up, this axe was kind of hidden behind some boards. It was something that uh, you had to look to see. I, I wouldn't say it was was hidden. It was it was concealed. Uh, by its placement, um, but if you had the right angle, you could, you could see it was there. Okay. All right. So Exhibit 214, can you please describe it? Exhibit 214 is a photograph showing staining that is on the area of where the axe head and the handle of the axe come together. This red staining is consistent in appearance with that of blood. Uh, there's also some dark staining on the metal uh, portion of the axe head itself. Exhibit 215. 
it is a yet another photograph of the axe with the axe head. And again, we can see staining in the area of where the axe head and handle intersect. Exhibit 216. It is a same photograph of, I'm sorry, it is a photograph of the same axe. However, it is the opposite side of the axe head. Again, we can see that there's uh, some dark uh, discoloration uh, in the area where the uh, uh, sharp end of the axe would be, um, and there is not the same discoloration in the area of the, the blunt side of the, the axe head. 217. 217 is a photograph of the same axe, and here we're referencing the, the handle area, and we can see on the handle that there is dark red, reddish brown staining. And 218. 218 is uh, another photograph of that same handle. It's just a, a more of an overview of the handle. And if you want to glove up, detective. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 219. What is Exhibit 219? Exhibit 219. <clears throat> exhibit 219 is the axe that I had collected from the garage. And there's various stickers. One of these stickers says biohazard. Why is that on there? There's a biohazard stick it on, sticker on there. Um, again, because of the reddish brown staining. Um, the reddish brown staining that is on the axe is human blood. I tested it with the phenolphthalein test, the presumptive positive. I then followed with the hexagon OBTI test to uh, determine if it's human blood or not. And the test came back positive for human blood. Deputy, would you please open up exhibit 219? And before you take it out, does Exhibit 219 appear to be in the same or substantially the same condition as when you collected it? It is, however, there's uh, a lot of the purple dye stain that is on there. Sure, from fingerprint testing. That would be consistent with testing the DNA. At this point, and it was sent to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab for a plethora of tests. Yes, it was. I would move Exhibit 219 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received. All right. Deputy, could you please pick up Exhibit 219 and, dis and maybe walk back and forth besides the jury and sh show them Exhibit 219? You would just put 219 back into the box. Thank 
you, sir. Exhibit 223. Could you describe Exhibit 223? Exhibit 223 is, again, a photograph in that same area where the axe was. Uh, it's depicting the uh, boards that are all standing on edge and leaning up against the interior side of the west wall of the garage. How would you describe Exhibit 224? Exhibit 224 is a uh, referred to as a bow saw or handle for a bow saw that is behind the uh, boards. This would have been just to the south of where the axe was um, or to the left in the previous photograph. And it's kind of behind some boards? Yes, it is. <clears throat> How would you describe Exhibit 225? Exhibit 225 is the uh, one end of the bow saw. Um, when I say it's a bow saw, it would normally have a uh, saw blade attached. However, the saw blade um, on this particular bow saw is absent. However, there is a small fragment or a piece of a broken saw that is uh, attached to the end of the bow saw. And that would be in the area where that silver round button looking uh, area is. Okay. If you want to put on some gloves, the big one. Deputy, I'm showing you what has been marked as Exhibit 226. From the stickers, uh, can you describe what 226 is? 226 is the broken blade section in the bow saw under evidence ID number 42202. Okay. Um, could you please open and visually examine 226, please? And does 226 appear to be in the same or substantially the same condition as when you or a member of your team collected it? It does, however, um, the end of the uh, saw blade uh, is no longer attached to the end of it. it is, there a, is it in a separate container? Yes. Okay. And again, that was sent for fracture match at the Wisconsin State Crime Lab? Yes, it was. This time I would move Exhibit 226 into evidence. No objection. It is received. And Deputy, if you could display uh, at least the major part of that saw to the jury, or both parts, yeah, to the jury.
Deputy, as you return Exhibit 226, do you see a brand name on it? I do. What is the brand name? It is Craftsman. Does it have any other markings or brand? Uh, it has this, uh, with the, uh, the number, and then it has the, uh, uh, another number of 21IN bolts on. And is there any marking or brand name on the blade part? Okay. Judge, can we approach just briefly? Sure. Want to repackage 226? I'm going to leave this for a further question later. Thank you, Deputy. I'll put it on the table in a minute. Exhibit 220. How would you describe Exhibit 220? Exhibit 220 is a photograph of a uh, Craftsman rolling tool chest that is against the north wall of the garage on the interior side uh, nearest to the northwest corner. How would you describe exhibit 221? This is a drawer that is in the lower section of the rolling uh, toolbox that I had opened and photographed. And exhibit, well, it's the same exhibit number. It just has the added circle, so 221. It appears to be zoomed in. Um, what would you describe there? This is a handle for a all-way um, handsaw with two saw blades um, that are linked together with uh, a middle wire of some sort. And in that circled area, can you read a brand name for that blade? I can I can see the always saw, but I cannot see uh, the brand on the on the blade itself. I'm sorry, I meant the saw. The always was the brand name. That's what I see. Yes. I'm going to show you, Deputy, what's already been marked and received as Exhibit 140. This was a tool found at the Irwin Road property. Could you please open up 140? And can you look at that saw and tell me what brand that tool is? This is a hallway manufacturing company. So same brand at the farm, this tool, as the one in the Craftsman toolbox at the 4595 Oak Springs address. That is correct. Okay. Do you want to put 140 back? Thank you.
Exhibit 13, moving on from the garage. What room is this? This is the family room that is on the lower level. This is the same level that the office is on. And the stairs that are depicted in the right side of the image ascend up to the main level um, or to the kitchen. Could you please describe Exhibit 14? Exhibit 14 is a overview of the uh, family room. Uh, there's the table with the chairs. There's a fan on the table. There's a lamp on the table. Uh, there's a neck brace on the table. And in, in the background, you can see the uh, stone fireplace. Exhibit 240. Exhibit. Um, can I, let me just ask you a question about those items on the table. Were they there when you first entered the home or were those items that the police placed there? This is a photograph of how we found the table um, at the residence prior to any work being done. So the fan was there next to the fireplace? On the table, correct. Please explain Exhibit 228. Exhibit 228 is a photograph. Um, it's an overall photograph of the stone fireplace. Uh, we can see the uh, fireplace insert, if you will, um, that is in the middle. That's the black rectangular framing uh, that has double bifold glass doors on it. Uh, to the left, there's a storage area for uh, kindling type wood with a bin. Exhibit 229, what is Exhibit 229? Exhibit 229 is uh, a pair of uh, work type gloves. And again, those were there when you arrived on scene? Correct. This is a photograph of how we found it. How would you describe Exhibit 230? Exhibit 230 is a photograph of the fireplace enclosure. Now, this fireplace is not a gas fireplace. This is a wood-burning fireplace. Um, there, is a, uh, bi there are bifold doors on the front. Um, we can see that there are three of the four panes of glass that are in place. The fourth pane of glass is absent. And if we look at the lower edge of the frame on the left side, we can see a portion of the glass that would normally be in that position. Please explain Exhibit 231. Exhibit 231 is a photograph of the same fireplace. And we can see again in the area where the glass should be, there are portions of glass still remaining. We can see that above that on the trim that uh, for the glass enclosure, um, that there's a, a silver uh, bare metal essentially um, where the, the paint has bubbled up and there is a disruption um, on that surface. I actually am going to go back a couple of slides. Um, in Exhibit 240 of the items on the table, is there also a measuring tape on that table? There is a measuring tape. It also appears to be some hand sanitizer. There's a hand sanitizer. Um, and I believe there is a target bag on the far right side. Maybe a bottle of Advil and uh, some sort of Star Wars uh, memorabilia? That is correct, yes. Okay. 232, could you please describe Exhibit 232? Exhibit 232 is a photograph of the far right side or the south side of the glass enclosure. This is on the family room side or the non-fire side. Um, it's showing the glass and, and streaks that are on the glass. Do you have any thoughts as to what caused those streaks? Objection, speculation. 
think you said foundation. Um, sustained, you can uh, lay foundation if you, sure. if you wish. Detector Leatherberry, um, have you been taught through your various trainings as a crime scene unit investigator, um, have you had some trainings pertaining to fire or arson? Yes, I have. I've attended the Dane County Arson Response Initiative training and received training in fire investigations. Additionally, have you had any um, training on crime, crime scene cleanup or how to process potential cleanup scenarios as you process a scene that a suspect may have left behind? Yes, I have. Based on those training and your experience, do you have any ideas as to what caused the streaking? It appears that an object was dragged across that surface in an attempt to clean that surface. It, there appears to be a residue. It, is that a fair statement? Yes, this appears to be a smear is actually what it appears to be. Could you describe at all what that residue um, was it dry, oily, something else? I really can't uh, get into that because I did not uh, do any further examinations of that. Okay, fair enough. Exhibit 236, could you please describe Exhibit 236? Exhibit 236 is the middle portion of the glass that remains intact. Um, that would be uh, in the middle of the photograph and we can see that there is a cloudy substance or smearing on the glass surface itself. And in the background, we can see the metal grate um, that is on the base of the fireplace. Exhibit 233, what are we seeing here? This is a photograph, a close-up photograph of the lower left portion or the uh, north side of the fireplace enclosure. What we see here is portions of the tempered glass that still remain within the door. And Deputy, as you examined this fireplace, both around it and inside of it, did you find glass either on the outside of it or inside of it? There were some small pieces of glass on the interior side of the um, fireplace itself. And Exhibit 234, what is the jury seeing there? This is a photograph of the bifolding door of the, on the north end of the fireplace enclosure. What we can see here is that the frame is still intact. There's the absence of the one piece of glass that has been broken out and the one pane of glass is present. And this might just be the angle of the photo, but could the door still close? It almost looks like it's off track. Yes, the door still closed. Okay. 241, what is the jury seeing in 241? In 241, we are seeing the area above the glass doors that is part of the enclosure. And what we're seeing here is the paint. There's the discoloration to the paint, and uh, there's actually bubbling that has occurred. Any educated guesses as to what caused the bubbling? Yes. Uh, high temperature causes the bubbling of the coating that is on that material. Could you please describe Exhibit 242? Exhibit 242 is a photograph of the same enclosure. Again, this is the far uh, left side if you're looking at it, or the north, and uh, this is above the area where the glass was broken out. What we see here is the different layers. We have the uh, layer of coating in the area of evidence marker letter L, and then we can see some bubbling to the paint as we move further to the right in this image. And as we continue, we can see that it is actually burned away from the metal material itself and has exposed the raw metal. And that's what you see all the way on the right side? That is correct. 
Exhibit 235, what is the jury seeing? Exhibit 235 is a photograph with the doors open, allowing us to see into the fireplace firebox. We can see that there is a metal grate. There are two logs situated from left to right or north and south. There is some unburnt newsprint paper material. There is a chain and a cable on the right side of the image that is for the damper. And below the fireplace grate is a uh, ash clean-out door. And what is an ash clean-out door? It's an area where the ash can be uh, deposited and, and swept into when cleaning the uh, fireplace out. Exhibit 237. Exhibit 237 is the photograph. It's a close-up photograph of the previous image that was depicted. What we can see in this image and drew my attention was the different discolorations on the grate itself. When we look at the grate, we can see that there are areas that are more gray or light in color. And then we see areas that are more dark um, or they have a wet appearance to them. Uh, when I had seen this, um, I knew that uh, there was something more burnt in this fireplace uh, other than just wood burning materials and newsprint. Um, and I elicited the help of the uh, ATF and the Wisconsin Department of Criminal Investigations Arson, Arson Response Unit um, to assist. And did they, in fact, come to assist? Yes, they came out on two occasions. They came out to do an evaluation um, to determine if this is something that they uh, would be able to assist with. Uh, Agent Special Agent Boswell from the DCI is a certified fire investigator with the State Fire Marshal's Office, which is a division of the Criminal Investigations Unit, as is uh, William Fulton, he's with the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol Tobacco, and Firearms. Um, he is also a certified fire investigator. I am not a certified fire investigator, but I knew enough that I needed to call for some help and, and get some assistance from the subject matter experts. Exhibit 238, what are we seeing on Exhibit 238? Again, this is the same fireplace grate. As we look to the far right, we can see the end of the chain hanging down. That's the damper that controls the flue, if you will. Um, we can see the uh, fireplace grate, um, the dark staining, and the, uh, the wood log that's in there, the brown and white wood log that is situated in the uh, fireplace grate. Exhibit 239, what is the jury seeing? Exhibit 239 is a photograph, it's a close-up photograph of the two logs that are situated in the grate. And we also can see the unburnt newsprint. If we look in the center of the image, we see a dark colored object that is burnt wood that has been placed on top of the unburnt newsprint. And if we look closer to the black burnt charred wood, there's a white object on that piece of wood. That white object is later determined to be human bone. And that determination was made by um, the forensic anthropologist? Yes, Dr. Christina Figueroa Soto. Looking at the wood, the newspaper, the bone, um, did you guys look at the date at all on that newspaper? We did, and we photographed the dates of all of those. I cannot recall what those dates are. All right. Stay tuned. All right. Exhibit 310. What is the jury seeing here? 
Exhibit 310 is showing a photograph of the uh, same fireplace. However, this was done, um, uh, taken after uh, additional chemical processing had been done within the house, as we can depict the two evidence markers uh, on the fireplace hearth, letter O and letter B is what I believe. Now, Exhibit 243, this starts to have placards in it. Yes, it does. And obviously, your department placed them there. I placed them there. Okay. Tell us about Exhibit 243. Exhibit 243 is a photograph depicting evidence markers with uh, alpha markers next to them. These are depicting individual stains of blood that I located on the dark tar-like floor. You can also see that there is a uh, marker on the hearth, letter B, uh, that is also from a reddish-brown stain that tested positive for blood. Exhibit 244, please des describe. Again, this is evidence marker letter B. This is on the fireplace hearth. It is on the grout. It's within the grout that is between the uh, two large hearth stones. And it's indicating a reddish brown stain. Exhibit 312. Exhibit 312 is a photograph of the same hearth. Letter B is referenced in the previous image. If we look in this image, we see that the letter N, which is on the floor, and the letter O is placed on the hearth. Those are markers were placed there after uh, chemical testing was done. Exhibit 311. Exhibit 311, again, is the same fireplace hearth. We can see the evidence markers F-E-D-C-I-N on the floor and the letter O and the letter B on the fireplace hearth. Exhibit 245. Exhibit 245 is a close-up photograph of the reddish brown stain next to evidence marker letter B. It is directly below the line in the middle um, that is the one centimeter line. And I see pointed out on these, on your placards, it also says which room. So this one says family. That is correct. I believe we saw one earlier that was B, but it said laundry. That is correct. So you use the same letters, but you indicate which room. We had to because of the number of items of evidence. Um, we we would have gotten into um, double lettering and uh, for ease of, of identifi identification, we decided to label them uh, with the numerical marker or the alpha marker for whichever room that we were in. What does Exhibit 246 show? Exhibit 246 again shows the same as the previous. It's a uh, medium shot of the uh, stains that were on the floor. I'm not going to have you open these, so up to you if you want to glove up or not. Deputy, I'm showing you what has been marked as Exhibit 249. Is your office's identification sticker also on Exhibit 249? It is. It is. And what is Exhibit 249? Exhibit 249 is uh, seven swabs that I collected from the floor of the family room, um, letters B through H. And how did you take these swabs? The swabs were collected individually. So a swab is basically a cotton Q-tip uh, with an applicator on one end. Uh, it has a wooden shaft. 
Um, they're approximately six inches long. We apply a single drop of sterile water to the tip of the swab, and with the tip of the swab, we place it into whatever material we're attempting to collect onto the tip of that swab. Once we collect that swab, it is then placed into a slide box. Now a slide box is consistent with that, like a matchbox. Um, it's placed into the slide box and uh, then it is sealed up. And does it exhibit uh, 249 also have uh, a sticker from the crime lab? Yes, it does. It has the M21, which indicates the Madison lab for the year of 2021, and the case number is 1575. At this time, I would move exhibit 249 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Deputy, I'll have you look at exhibit 250. Please describe exhibit 250. Exhibit 250 um, are individual swabs of the stains next to evidence marker letter N and evidence marker letter O. These stains were um, identified when the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory uh, responded with their field response unit to utilize luminol. Now, luminol is a chemical that we utilize to spray, uh, is a liquid form that we spray onto hard surfaces. And what we're looking for is blood stains that are, uh, appear to have been cleaned up um, or stains that have been cleaned up but are not visible to the naked eye. Just because a blood stain is wiped from a surface, it doesn't mean it's gone. Uh, there could be trace amounts still on that surface and they will be represented as uh, a uh, fluorescent blue colored uh, uh, glow when uh, you apply the luminol. Luminol is done in the hours of darkness or when we can make the room completely dark and it will fluoresce when it reacts with the blood. Um, these two stains are stains that reacted with the blood but were not seen by me when I uh, was doing my examination and found all the other stains. And specifically, was it Nick Stalky from the Wisconsin State Crime Lab who did the luminol? Yes, Nick Stalky and his team um, with John Ertl as an assistant and the two photographers assisted with uh, the process. At this time, I would move Exhibit 250 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Deputy, you're not going to be approached with a blow up of a photograph. It is five, five, six, exhibit 556. Five, Could you please identify exhibit 556? Again, this is a photograph that I had taken of the uh, fireplace. This shows the fireplace hearth with the alpha number uh, letters, I'm sorry, of O and B on the hearth. And then it shows the additional letters that are on the floor. Um, does it appear to be a true and accurate depiction of what you observed? Yes, it is. At this time, I would move exhibit 556 into evidence. Any objection? No objection. It is received. <coughs> it may be published. Bill, do you just want to maybe walk it in front of the jury so folks over on this side can see? Okay. All right, now back to your little screen. 
Exhibit 251, how would you describe Exhibit 251? Exhibit 251 is a photograph of an open freezer that was located in the basement. Now, this freezer is against uh, the west wall of the basement, if you will, and it is adjacent to the stairs that descend from the office area. And this basement, how would you describe the basement in general? Is it one big room, kind of two little rooms, something else? As you descend down the stairs and you're facing to the east, uh, there's a natural, there's a wall, a, a, a center block wall that runs down the middle of the basement from east to west. Uh, it separates the north side of the basement and the south side of the basement. There's wood framing uh, that extends from the west end of the wall that uh, continues uh, to the west. The cinder block wall at the east end intersects with the foundation of the basement itself. Exhibit 252. Exhibit 252 shows uh, the same freezer then we can see that it is uh, open. To the left of the freezer is a uh, upright freezer. We can see the gray door with the silver handle. Beyond the freezer, there is a rolling baker's rack type shelving that has, uh, for the lack of better terms, the uh, uh, COVID supplies. There's all kinds of uh, supplies on on that uh, rack that has been stocked up. And to the right of the image, we can see the cement stairs that ascend up to the um, office level and family room level. Exhibit 253, what is it appears in Exhibit 253? Exhibit 253, we can see inside of the freezer itself. We can see that there is nothing inside of the, ref uh, the freezer. Uh, we can see that there's indentations in the base of the freezer. Um, we can see in the lower portion of the uh, um, freezer uh, that is nearest to the photographer, which was myself, um, a, uh, a raised white portion uh, for a drain. And why did you become, obviously you took several pictures of this freezer. Why did you do that? Uh, quite frankly, it was, it was out of place. Um, it's, it's up against the uh, area where the supplies were, so it was in the way. Um, it also was standing open, uh, which I didn't think was normal. Uh, when I discovered this, um, I was not made aware of this. Um, again, we talked about briefing and talking with detectives, and information that I had received was that detectives and patrol deputies had previously been to the residence for when Chandler reported his parents missing. And during that time, they were in the house. And I couldn't think for a good reason why somebody would forget to tell me about a freezer that was in the basement. Uh, so I placed a phone call to Detective Sims and asked about the freezer, um, of why that freezer was in the basement and uh, it was not that she told me it was not there when when they were there uh, on their walkthrough. Um, so again, that drew more attention. We have a freezer that just is out of place. Um, the lid is open, and it was not in that same location when the detectives and deputies were there when the missing persons report was filed. Obviously, it appears empty in this picture. Was there any food in it that you had to remove? 
No, this is the condition that it was in. Um, I also noted that uh, it was very, very clean. Um, I also observed that there was a, uh, a drain, which we cannot see in this particular image, but looking down inside, it would be the lower left corner of this image. Um, and it appeared to have a, a liquid-like substance in it. Exhibit 254. Can you see that drain in Exhibit 254? Yes, this is a better representation of what I just described. The gray uh, drain um, for the freezer is located in the lower left portion of this freezer. We can see that there is not a plug in place on the interior side and neither was there a plug in place on the exterior. What, if anything, did you do concerning that drain? I took a swab of the drain and tested it with phenolphthalein, and I received a presumptive positive with uh, phenolphthalein for the presence of blood. I then followed it with the hexagon OBTI test. The hexagon OBTI test, as I explained earlier, is for the presence of human blood, and it indicated that for the presence of human blood that there was human blood present. So, for example, just to try to explain it, if you had steak that was bloody and went into that drain, that wouldn't result in a positive with your second test? It absolutely would not. Human blood is what tests positive. Correct. Deputy, I'm approaching you with Exhibit 374. Can you look at Exhibit 374? How would you describe it? Uh, this is a swab of the blood from the freezer drain that I had taken. And this also has been uh, submitted to the State Crime Laboratory for analysis. Also has the biohazard sticker? Yes, it does. I would move Exhibit 374 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received. All right. Exhibit 255. How would you describe Exhibit 255? Again, Exhibit 255 is, again, showing that same freezer. Now we have the reference of the stairs to the right side that ascend up to the office slash family room level. Uh, we can see the freezer, uh, the chest-type freezer that is open, as well as the uh, upright freezer and the uh, north center block wall of the basement foundation. One more question about that chest freezer. Was it plugged in? No, it was not. How about the upright freezer? Was it plugged in? Yes, the upright freezer was plugged in. And uh, when I had opened it, the contents with inside of that freezer uh, were cold. And those contents were food? There were all, all kinds of food in there, yes. Exhibit 256. How would you describe Exhibit 256? Exhibit 256 is a uh, photograph of one of the shelves that was behind the freezer, which would have been essentially between the freezer and the west wall of the basement on the south half, if you will. In this photograph, we can see that there's a couple bottles of Tide, a couple bottles of Dawn, um, there is a, a brown bottle with a uh, white cap, and uh, I noted that the, the seal was broken on that cap. So what did you do? I picked it up to determine what it was after photographing it, and it is an uh, empty bottle of hydrogen peroxide. And I am going to have you open this one, so I don't know if you want to glove and mask up or not. But 
Could you please uh, look at the stickers on Exhibit 282 when you have a moment? And what do you believe Exhibit 282 is? Exhibit 282 is the bottle of hydrogen peroxide that I collected uh, from the basement. It was on the uh, cell side. It was on the shelf that was previously uh, in the photograph. Could you please open and visually inspect Exhibit 282? And is that the bottle of peroxide you collected? Yes, it is. At this point, I would move Exhibit 282 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Now, why in the world did you collect a bottle of common peroxide? Well, there's a couple of reasons why I collected the bottle of uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, number one is it was out of place. Uh, we, we have a storage shelf that has stored supplies, um, and they're in, in great quantities. Um, but there is an empty bottle of hydrogen peroxide that just did not fit. In addition, my experience in working with the uh, Dane County Medical Examiner's Office, um, I attend autopsies. And one of the products that they utilize to uh, neutralize and clean up blood if they were to get it on some paperwork is hydrogen peroxide. Does hydrogen peroxide have any smell? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Unlike cleaners such as bleach? It definitely does not smell like bleach. Exhibit 257, what do you observe there? Exhibit 257 is a bottle of hand cleaner, um, the distilled water, um, and then it appears to be a, uh, a void area. What is Exhibit 258? This is a photograph of the south wall of the basement on the south side. This is the uh, foundation wall. And there are uh, a series of storage shelves on uh, the north side of that wall. They are the, uh, the black uh, shelving units. And we can see that they're neatly organized with uh, translucent totes and boxes. Exhibit 259, what is that display? Exhibit 259 displays a yellow roll of duct tape that I observed that was uh, on the shelf on top of one of the translucent, translucent bins as we see in this photograph. Exhibit 260. This is a close-up photograph that I took of the yellow duct tape uh, we can see here that uh, the cut end of the duct tape is visible. And again, 261? Is another photograph of the cut end of the uh, duct tape. When you're taking all these pictures of the yellow duct tape, were you aware of a garbage bin that was collected for evidence at the Irwin Road property? Oh, yes, I was. Were you aware of the fact that some yellow duct tape was found in that garbage bin? I saw the yellow duct tape inside that, that bin, and this yellow duct tape, again, it jumped out at me because um, it was consistent in appearance and color, um, and I definitely know that this was an important piece of evidence that needed to be collected. So did you collect it? Yes. I'm going to show you, Deputy, what has been marked as Exhibit 283. How would you describe Exhibit 283? 
Exhibit 283 is the yellow roll of duct tape that was collected by myself. Um, it also has crime laboratory markings for the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, um, item H and H1. Uh, what is different about the tape at this point is that uh, the tag end of the tape has been pulled off of the roll and appears to have been affixed to a clear piece of acetate. Now this would be consistent with something that we would uh, that would be done at the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory when we asked them to do a fracture match. Again, we submit this to the subject matter experts who are trained uh, in making comparisons and they can take the uh, unknown sample from the garbage bin, if you will, and attempt to fracture match it back to a known standard and that being this roll of tape that was at the scene. To put it crudely, they can tell you whether or not it's like two puzzle pieces, whether they fit together or not. That is a very good uh, explanation of it, yes. Okay. I would move exhibit 283 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received. What is Exhibit 262 display? Exhibit 262 is a photograph in the basement. This is a photograph, I believe, of the uh, north wall of the basement. What we see in this photograph is uh, a window that is actually, you can't see the window, it's covered with the uh, towels that have been hung uh, to prevent uh, light coming into the basement. And did police hang these up when they luminaled or were these already there when you arrived? No, we did not. Those, these were already there when we arrived. This is a photograph of how it was when, when we uh, initially uh, saw the scene. And exhibit 263. This is again a photograph of the window covering. In this photograph we can see that a uh, blue uh, clamp has been used to uh, cover uh, the window and attach basically the the uh, the blanket to the uh, um, the floor joist roof, uh, ceiling supports. Two six four. Could you please describe this image? Uh, Two six four. We can see the. Um, west wall of the basement. Now it's hard to see, but at the very left side, you can see a yellow stripe just to the left of that. That would be where the steers are that ascend up to the office or the uh, um, family room level. Um, what we see here is the cinder block wall. Uh, there's a wood bench uh, that is blue in color. There's a uh, butcher block style uh, work bench top that is in the foreground. To the left of that, we can see a floor safe. We can see a uh, gray tote bin on top of that. And the floor safe, just to make sure the jury is focused on the, it is on the lower left hand corner. Correct. It is the gray um, safe, and you can see the evidence marker letter C is on that safe. Exhibit 268. How would you describe Exhibit 268? Exhibit 268 is a photograph, uh, medium shot of the uh, left side of the workbench. In the far left, we can see the stairs that ascend up to the basement level. We can see there are evidence placards, letter A, B, C, the letter G, and the letter F. Exhibit 269, please describe that for the jury. 
Exhibit 269 is uh, the floor safe with the evidence marker letter C on it. We can see above the letter C and to the right that there are uh, round circles. Those round circles are blood stains. Uh, they were observed as reddish brown stains uh, by Deputy Jim Plenty and myself. Uh, Deputy Jim Plenty and I uh, determined that uh, we would collect the stains individually. Um, I sampled a portion of uh, the stain that is above the letter C and tested that with phenolphthalein and it confirmed that it was present for blood. I again followed with the second and subsequent test, the hexagon OBTI test. That hexagon OBTI test was positive for the presence of human blood. The remainder of the stains on that were not tested, they were simply collected. And why is that? Because they're in the same general area. Again, we talked about um, the most probative value in submitting items to the state crime laboratory because of, of the limitations that we have in submitting items. Um, this is a, a, a screening process that we utilize so we can uh, submit the evidence with the best value. And uh, knowing that there was blood on that surface um, and it was human blood, we did not need to continue uh, testing additional stains, we were confident that additional stains could be sent out and tested by the crime lab. Do you ever, because of the size of a, sa a stain or sample, have to make choices as to which tests you do or what you do with the sample? Absolutely. We can never consume a sample. That means when I do a test with phenolphthalein, I cannot utilize the entire sample because I'm only testing to determine if it's blood. If I utilize that entire sample, there is nothing left to send to the lab. I then have to make that same determination if there's enough sample left to be able to do the hexagon OBTI test. And doing the hexagon OBTI test, it simply tells me if it's human or non-human. It does not tell me whose blood it is. Again, I cannot consume that entire sample there has to be sample remaining to be able to be sent to the crime lab. Deputy, I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 373. Can you please review the labels of Exhibit 373 and tell us what it is? These are the uh, seven swabs that I collected from the face of uh, the safe that was in the photographs previously. Uh, There's listed as swabs NS, so meaning north side of the basement, and they're swabs C1 through 7. And is there also a sticker on that uh, ex on Exhibit 373 from the Wisconsin State Crime Lab? Yes, this item was submitted to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab under case number M21-1575, and the item number or letter designation is Y, as in Young. There are additional stickers that are applied by the crime lab, and they appear to be Y1 through Y7. At this time, I would move Exhibit 373 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Okay. Moving on, can you please describe Exhibit 270? Exhibit 270 is a photograph taken in the basement. Again, we're on the north side of the basement. This would be in the northwest corner of the basement. Uh, we can see a refrigerator to the right. There is a bicycle in the background. There are alpha markers, the letter D and letter E that are on the floor. And what D and E, what, what are those denoting? believe letter E is a bullet fragment. 
showing you Exhibit 272. What does Exhibit 272 show? Exhibit 272, we can see a gray piece of metal that has staining on it. And when we uh, look at this, we can see that uh, there's no uniformity to it. It is consistent with um, a projectile. Projectile. Is that a fancy word for bullet? Uh, but that is the portion of the bullet. The bullet is made up of the casing, uh, powder, a primer, and then the projectile itself that is propelled from the firearm. So this is a bullet from a firearm. Down towards the bottom right, is there anything an yes, additional it's, metal Yes, it's on fragment? the edge of the screen. Um, there's an additional small fragment. So there was two metal fragments. That is correct. Deputy, I'm now going to show you exhibits 285 and 286. I'm actually probably going to have you open these up. So um, just while you're gloving up, what, are the, what is the label of Exhibit 285 seem to be per your office's label? The Exhibit 285 is a metal fragment from the basement floor that was next to evidence marker letter E. It is under evidence ID number 41873. This also was submitted to the Wisconsin State Laboratory, uh, Crime Laboratory. Um, it has their case number with the evidence uh, sub-designator that they utilize of L and L2. All right, and I'll have you, and it also has a biohazard sticker. Yes, it does. Okay. I'll ask you to open up Exhibit 285. This time I'd move exhibit 285 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Could you walk it slowly in front of the jury, please, so they can observe it? Exhibit 285. Place it back in the box. I'll give you a chance to change your gloves and all. And what is Exhibit 286, according to the label from your department? Exhibit 286 is the metal fragment from the basement floor that was found near evidence marker letter E. It is affixed with evidence ID number 41874. And does it also have Wisconsin State Crime Law? There's a sub-designator letter M is in Mary is received and it may be published I 
and it appears to be in what I would describe as a small test tube. Is that fair, or what would you call it? Like a small plastic cup. Okay. Could you please walk that by the jury? And Deputy, as you package that up, when you discovered 285 and 286, did you know that they were part of a projectile or bullet? The, at that point, I did not know they were. They were consistent in appearance with that of a projectile. Um, but again, you submit them to the state crime laboratory. To their subject matter experts for further evaluation. Exhibit 273, what are we observing? I'm sorry, you said 273? Uh, yes, I believe that's okay. the... Exhibit. exhibit 273 is a photograph that was taken of the workbench. And in this photograph, we can see uh, on the bottom left portion, a portion of that floor safe and that tote bin that we previously saw in the overall image that when we were looking to the west, we can see a uh, blue bench and a uh, on the shelf of the bench, there is a uh, spent fire extinguisher. Judge, this might be a good time to take a break. The next couple of slides are gonna involve a lot of exhibits. I see no reason to disagree. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take 10 minutes at this point in time. Randy. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Langer. I am the digital content manager for channel3000.com. As you just heard, they're going to take a quick 10-minute uh, break or so here in day five of the Chandler Holderson trial. Uh, as we've kind of been seeing for the last uh, several hours here, we're going, going through the Holderson house, basically getting a, a very in-depth and thorough look at uh, what investigators found when they started to really piece through the Holderson home. Uh, we, we've had this uh, same deputy, Deputy Greg Leatherberry from the Dane County Sheriff's Office, on the stand for much of the day, uh, including before the lunch break. So he was one of the main uh, investigators to really kind of go through the house, take t a lot of photos. We've seen a lot of photos in the last couple of hours here. Um, some rooms, there was no evidence found of anything. Uh, other rooms uh, clearly more significant to the case. Uh, Post-lunch, what we've seen so far is, is really a close look at that fireplace that's sort of been one of the focuses in the Halderson home during this investigation. What they found there was uh, the broken glass that we've heard from day one. That's where Chandler says he was playing with the dogs and he threw the ball and one of the dogs crashed into one of the window panes and, and uh, broke one of the panes of glass. Uh, prosecutors would actually say or claim in their opening arguments that that's where Chandler tried to burn some of his parents' remains. Uh, we saw some testimony from the deputy there talking about seeing some bubbling up above the, the top of the frame of that fireplace, maybe indicating uh, extremely high temperatures there. What they also found inside the fireplace was uh, a combination of some burnt and unburnt logs, some newspaper uh, that wasn't burned, but 
uh, in are on top, I should say, of one of the uh, burnt logs. They say they found bone fragments. Uh, so they found bone fragments inside that fireplace where they claim that uh, Chandler Halderson would have tried to uh, get rid of some of the remains of his parents. Uh, that was all sent off to the crime lab for testing, that kind of thing. Uh, we might hear later uh, what those results came back as. But as of now, we heard that deputy de uh, testify that they did find those bone fragments inside that fireplace, one of the big revelations of today. Uh, as they continued through, they went to the basement of the Halderson home. They said they found a freezer there that uh, seemed like it was out of place. It, it was odd to them, so they looked more into it. The freezer was had its lid open. They said they looked inside and it looked extremely clean, but when they tested it for blood, especially the, the drain at the bottom of that freezer where you would kind of drain out the bottom of a freezer, they found uh, trace amounts of human blood. So it's not like, uh, as the prosecutor said, it's not like they were storing steaks in there and some blood got down there. They were able to determine it was human blood found in that drain of that freezer there. Uh, looking around elsewhere in the basement, they found a safe on the floor that had some blood splatter on it also tested positive for human blood. They sent that into the state crime lab as well. Um, they also found some metal fragments on the floor of the basement, which they later determined to be bullet fragments. So uh, they haven't said what gun that those bullet fragments came from, but they tested those off and sent those off to the state crime lab as well. Um, elsewhere in the basement too, they found blood stains on the floor, some blood splatter. Uh, they found blood stains in front of that fireplace in the family room, too. Um, so lots of uh, little pieces of evidence here as they go through uh, pretty meticulously through the entire house here. Um, also in that basement, they found uh, an empty bottle of hydrogen peroxide. We had heard earlier, you know, testimony that uh, Chandler's girlfriend at the time, he had asked her several times to bring over a bottle of hydrogen peroxide. They found an empty bottle next to a bunch of full bottles of other cleaning products. Investigators thought that was kind of odd, so they noted that and took that in as well. They also found a used roll of yellow duct tape. So um, if you were with us this morning, you heard other testimony saying that they found uh, this plastic garbage bin in the woods where they found Bart Holderson's remains in the farm in Cottage Grove. They said the duct tape they found in the basement of the Halderson home was consistent with that duct tape inside that bin uh, that was also uh, in the garbage bin with some bloody tarps as well. Uh, they also found, uh, going to the garage, they found an axe handle covered uh, with blood or dried blood on it in the uh, garage. They found blood on the axe head in the garage too, and this axe was sort of uh, hidden away behind uh, a pile of boards propped up against the wall in the garage as well. Uh, so investigators also took that in, and just like with a lot of the other pieces of evidence today, they uh, actually had the physical axe, they had the physical pieces of evidence that they collected, that they took out of evidence collection, and then they had the deputies show the jury up close uh, so they could get a, their own set of eyes on it. They don't have to rely on the photos uh, from the crime scene. So they, they got to actually lay eyes on a lot of these pieces of evidence being presented today. So obviously just a lot to kind of sift through here this afternoon. Um, unlike last week when we saw a lot of uh, in-depth testimony of, of people who knew Barton Krista Halderson and, and knew Chandler Halderson and, and lots of emotional testimony. This seems to be a lot more fact-based. We're now kind of getting into the uh, very, very, <laughs> a lot of details, I should say, of uh, what they've found as they've gone through the house here. Um, so we're going to expect to hear more of that. This testimony will continue after this break. They just wanted to give the jury, uh, again, as they have throughout the course of this trial, uh, 10 minutes or so to kind of just stand up, stretch their legs, and, and kind of uh, 
get a break as before diving right back into everything here. So again, we're going to be here to kind of recap everything. If you missed it, uh, if you missed the morning session at all, we have a recap of that already up over at channel3000.com. You can see it there. It's our top story there. Uh, there's also a link to our Chandler Holderson trial page in the uh, description of these live streams. So you can click that link there for more information as well. It's also where you can find, you know, if you're jumping into this case in, in the middle of week two here, if you want to find out what happened last week, we have all those recaps posted there as well. So that's a great spot to go if you're trying to catch up on this case and, and see what this was all about. So uh, we're going to keep monitoring these developments here all afternoon and uh, write them up as they come and, and you'll find them here. Uh, I'll, I'll be here to recap everything. Uh, once they go to break, that kind of thing. But I'll also write everything up over at channel3000.com, and that is where you can continue to get those updates. Uh, for now, we're going to sign off here, but we'll be back when the jury is brought back into the courtroom. Uh, we'll see you here in a few minutes, everyone.
Raymond. Thank you. In Exhibit 274, what is the jury seeing in Exhibit 274? Exhibit 274 is a photograph of a spent cartridge shell that was located on the floor under the blue workbench. It would have been located closest to the west wall of the basement and at the south end of the workbench, which is the end closest to the stairs and that sit floor safe. And just for those that are not super familiar with, with firearms, what is a casing? A casing is the uh, metal component that is hollow and has gunpowder within it. If we look at the round cylinder end of this particular casing, you can see there's a light colored yellow insert around the uh, green uh, metal portion of the casing. That is the primer end of the casing. The projectile is uh, attached to the opposite end and is usually crimped uh, to create a seal. The primer from the, um, sorry, the a firing pin from the firearm will strike the primer end. Again, that primer end is that uh, light yellow colored uh, disc with inside of the green metal surrounding it. When it strikes the primer, it creates an explosion and ignites the gunpowder with inside of the bullet. The pressure with inside of the capsule because it's sealed, forces the projectile out of the uh, bullet, I'm sorry, out of the casing, down the barrel of the firearm. And that's essentially how it works. Okay, thank you. And then I'm gonna show exhibit 275. What are we seeing on exhibit 275? Again, this is a, another photograph of the same projectile that was located on the floor in the basement. Again, we can see that inner disc that is a, a lighter yellow color or gold color, and then there's the darker green casing for uh, the casing itself. This, uh, this uh, casing was, was actually located on the basement floor by crime scene investigator Jim Plenty, um, who then called to my attention that he had found something. Um, and then I came down and assisted him in the basement with uh, taking these photographs. Deputy, I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 284. How would you describe Exhibit 284? Exhibit 284 is the casing that was collected by myself. There's the casing that was in the previous photograph that was under the on the floor under the workbench. It has the uh, alpha marker letter G. Letter G was one of the placards that we seen in a previous image of the overall images, and it was yellow in color. It is affixed with uh, uh, evidence ID number 41877 that I applied. It's the Sheriff's Office uh, evidence barcode number. It also has the Wisconsin State Crime Lab case number uh, There's the same as previously mentioned, and they subdesignated this item of evidence as letter A H. This time, I would move Exhibit Two Eight Four into evidence. No objection. It is received. And Deputy, I'm also going to give you Exhibit Twenty Six. This is a a bullet um, given to Mitchell Helderson by the defendant. I'd ask you just to to just look at those both. Uh, 284 and 
Exhibit 26. And I'd ask if you see any similarities between the items. They are similar in color. Um, I also know that the head stamp is the same. Now the head stamp is the uh, manufacturer's stamping that is on the head or the primer end of the casing. It's not on the primer, it's on the casing. So it's not on the yellow portion of the disc, it's on the green portion of the metal casing. Um, when I first saw this casing um, that was in the basement, I'm looking for a uh, the name of a manufacturer. A lot of times the manufacturers will put their uh, initials um, or they may even uh, put the, the full name of the company that manufactures them. This particular company uh, did not. This particular company um, put a logo on there. And knowing that this type of uh, casing is consistent with a cartridge that would be used for a uh, AK-47 or an SKS type rifle. Um, I was wondering if it was maybe some type of imported ammunition from another country and that's what I was trying to decipher. I later learned that the uh, writing that is on the crown of the head stamp is uh, for a company uh, named Barnall. I also observed that on the head stamp on the lower arch of that round uh, casing, the number 7.62 by 39. And that is the same head stamp that is on the uh, exhibit number 26, Sheriff's Office ID number 417, which is the uh, ammunition from M. Period Halderson. Um, this particular piece of evidence, um, as we look in comparison to the casing of the one that was found within the basement, it is just the casing. And if we look at the one that is marked as Exhibit 26, it has a copper colored projectile that is still intact. It also has a primer in it, and that primer is not dented, indicating that this is a complete round and it has not been fired. So exhibit 26, not fired. Exhibit 284, a fired casing. Yes, a fired casing, also referred to sometimes as a spent shell casing. I'm going to leave these two up here. We have more ammunition we're going to compare in a minute. Deputy, how would you ex um, describe Exhibit 276? Looking at Exhibit 276, we're facing to the east. This is on the north side of the basement or the north half of the basement. We see that there's a uh, wooden bookshelf, the natural wood color, to the, wood color to the right. There's a safe that is black with a silver face next to it. We can see that there's a uh, plastic table and then there are two folding chairs that are uh, folded in the uh, uh, chair position and there are two additional chairs on the left side of that image. If we look at the concrete type floor, uh, the concrete floor as well as the walls in the basement are painted uh, in a, a gray type paint. We can see that there is a defect on the floor that is uh, on the photographer's side or the near side of the chair that is uh, to the right in this image. The defect is uh, a, a white, uh, and this image appears to be a, a, a round or elliptical type defect. Exhibit 277. Exhibit 277 is a, a, a medium shot of that 
uh, same defect in the concrete floor. Exhibit 278. Exhibit 278 is the same defect. This time we've added evidence marker letter H uh, to it. We can see that uh, when we get closer with the imagery that there is some depth to the defect um, and it is, is not uniform uh, in, in its edges are, are, are jagged. And why is this defect interesting to you? Uh, there were other defects on the floor, but this defect was interesting because um, it was absent of grime. Now, I can't say that it's fresh, but I can tell you it is not aged like the other defects that were on the floor. It doesn't have dirt or debris within that defect like the other defects had. Uh, it's not uncommon for a basement floor to have scratches or gouges, um, but this this one, um, it... Uh, it stood out and it, it still had a, um, like a powder, like uh, uh, busted concrete uh, texture within the um, uh, defect itself. 547, what are we looking at in 547? In 547, we're looking at uh, the floor on the south half of the basement. We're on the west side of the basement facing to the east. We see evidence markers letter F, and we see evidence markers letter G. Now, if we look, you can see that the basement floor uh, doesn't look the same as, as in the original images that we had taken. This photograph was taken after uh, the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory Field Response Unit came out to assist us. It consisted, again, of uh, Nick Stalke, John Ertl and the two photographers that came out to do the luminol. And what you see here is the residue, the white residue that is left behind when luminol is sprayed onto the hard surface. I further say that letter F and letter G are areas that uh, fluoresce or luminesce that um, we collected um, uh, swabs from the, the concrete floor. Which brings us to Exhibit 287. Deputy, could you please look at the labels on Exhibit 287 and describe what 287 is? 287 are three swabs from the south side of the basement area. G, F, and F. The Sheriff's Office barcode number is 41884. And it also has Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory uh, case number with sub designations of AB, AB1, AB2, and AB3. Now, in the image I told you, there were two areas that were collected. The uh, Area F was um, swabbed twice, so two swabs were taken from Area F, and they were uh, uh, collected separately. I would move 287 into evidence. No objection. It is received. How would you describe Exhibit 292? I'm not sure I heard you correctly. Was that 292? Yes. Exhibit 292 is a photograph that I took of the basement. Again, this is in the south side of the basement. It is in the southwest corner. Um, as we see now, the freezer has been removed and collected as evidence. It is no longer in front of the uh, wire rack rolling storage unit that has the supplies on it. We can see the left side of the photograph, there's the gray door with the silver handle for the upright vertical freezer. There's a shop vac that is uh, on the floor. And then we can see 
that there's an area that uh, protrudes north of the foundation itself. Um, that would be the area below the front steps that would be commonly referred to as a stoop. Um, and in some instances, uh, in home construction, they get filled in. In other instances, they get capped off and they can be used as additional storage areas. Exhibit 293. Exhibit 293 is a photograph of the north, I'm sorry, it's on the south side of the basement. It is the southwest corner. Um, we can see the center block wall, and then we can see above the center block wall, there are silver pipes. Those silver pipes are conduit that contain electrical wires within it. You can see the junction box that is affixed to the cinder block wall. We can see that there are a couple pieces of wood that are attached to the, uh, to the wall. And the area above the cinder block is, has a uh, wood construction um, creating a, a wall above the, the cinder block. You can see. Oops, sorry. You can see that there's the um, uh, gray paper-like material. It's got some red writing on it. That is the uh, paper side of the insulation that was placed inside of that cavity. The area that is between the uh, two by four studs um, and. Uh, it's for insulation purposes. Exhibit 294. Is just another photograph of that same area. Again, again we can see the, um, the red markings for the insulation. And what does Exhibit 295 display? Exhibit 295 is uh, an area the cavity that is exposed once the insulation is removed from the studs. And when we look in the lower portion of that image, we can see that steel pipe. And then beyond it, there are some black um, triangular looking pieces. Those pieces uh, are consistent with uh, a mouthpiece that would be used on a vape type instrument. Um, which is a instrument that a person sometimes uses if they're a smoker um, to uh, mimic uh, cigarettes. And was this vape mouthpiece um, out in the open like this or was it behind insulation? It could not be seen. It was concealed within that cavity and it was uh, covered with the insulation. Upon learning that, did you guys then remove more insulation in the area? We removed all the insulation in the basement after seeing that. There was an indicator that um, somebody was hiding something in the basement. Those, those were put there purposely. They're not left there by accident. Exhibit 296. Exhibit 296, we can see in the bottom left portion those same vape mouthpieces. However, as I pulled back more of the insulation and exposed the cavity created by the two by four walls, you can see the magazine from a firearm that also contains bullets. The uh, magazines are concealed within the wall and hidden with the insulation covering them so they could not be seen unless the insulation was removed from the wall. So the magazines were hidden behind the insulation? Correct. They could not be seen without removing the insulation. And the insulation was put back into place um, as it, it really did not look out of place. Um, but during our extensive search, um, I decided to pull back insulation and dig a little bit deeper and a little bit further, and this is what I found. And obviously by magazine, you don't mean Sports Illustrated. What's a magazine for people that are not gun users? So a magazine 
is uh, a part of the firearm. Not every firearm has them, but on some firearms that are semi-automatic, um, they have a storage container that is called a magazine. The bullets are pushed into the magazine from the top, and when you see the uh, bullets, that is the top of the magazine. As you push the next round in, they compress a spring that is at the base, and the magazines have different capacities. These magazines uh, hold multiple rounds of ammunition. That magazine is then placed into the firearm, and then is, the spring will feed the firearm and force additional ammunition into the chamber of that firearm as it cycles each time the trigger is pulled. What do you observe in Exhibit 297? Exhibit 297 is after I pulled the insulation from the wall, I stepped back and took an overall photograph. This is for reference, so a person who uh, was not there can understand where within the basement those were located. How would you describe Exhibit 298? Exhibit 298 is a close-up of the three magazines that I located concealed within the basement wall. The magazines are of a uh, polymer or plastic-like material, um, and there are three of them. I collected each of them, uh, one of them listed as the front, which is the one closest in the image, one listed as top, which is the one in the highest portion of this image, and then one listed as bottom, which is the one that's leaning over on the far right side of this image. Exhibit 299, how would you describe Exhibit 299? Exhibit 299 is when I completely remove all of the insulation. Again, this photograph is to show the condition in which they were found and in relation to the vape mouthpieces that were located, uh, again, just a reference. Exhibit 300. Again, this is another perspective allowing a better view of the third magazine, the one that's listed as bottom. In each one of these magazines, we can see that there are bullets in each of those magazines. And 301, just I, another perspective view. Again, it's just another reference photograph <clears throat> so that the viewer can have a understanding as to where they were located within the basement. And same for 135? Correct. It's an or, sorry, 302. The 302 is a overview, again, showing in relation to the um, storage shelf and the uh, uh, magazines. Okay. Deputy, I'm going to approach you now with exhibits 288, 289, and 290. And I'm going to have you describe the labels on Exhibit 288 first. Exhibit 288 is the magazine that was listed as the front uh, with ammo. It's got evidence ID number 42258 affixed to it. I would move at this time Exhibit 288 into evidence. No objection. It is received. I'd ask that you open it up, and I'm actually going to have you count the amount of rounds in that magazine. Could 
Yes, thank you. Will you just hold it up for the jury? All right, now if you would count the rounds, sir. The rounds have been removed. Okay. Okay, they don't have to be standing up. Just count the amount. Twenty. Okay. And that was exhibit two eighty eight. If you would return the rounds and magazine to the box. Have you repeat the same procedure with item 290? Item 290 is the rifle magazine listed as bottom with ammo uh, that I collected from the wall. Okay, I would move exhibit 290 into evidence. No objection. It is received. <clears throat> Again, I would ask that you count the bullets. No need to display them if you just want to count them. Thank you. If you want to return those items to the bag, to the box. And finally, I'd like you to repeat the same procedure with item 289. And what does the label from your department say for 289? Exhibit 289 is a rifle mag top with ammo. Evidence ID number 42259. This is a magazine which I collected that was concealed within the wall. 
All right, I would move 289 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received. And again, yes, please, count the rounds. So only 15 rounds in exhibit 289. That is correct. <clears throat> so missing five rounds as compared to the other two magazines. Yes. Okay. Now, but maybe before you close that, um, the bullets in all three of these magazines, um, is the, their ammunition consistent with each other? Yes, and looking at the head stamp on the ammunition, they're all the same color, the same caliber, 7.62 by 39, and they all have the same uh, head stamp from the manufacturer that is the logo for Bernal. And is that the same head stamp that you identified in the get well bullet as well as the casing found on the basement floor? I don't recall which one was a get well bullet. Oh, I'm sorry, exhibit 26. Yes, they're all the same. Okay, this one just has get well written in Sharpie on it. So all of the ammunition that is displayed up here is all the same caliber, all the same head stamp. That is correct. No further questions. Cross-examination. Yes, thank you. Detective, excuse me, deputy, approximately how much, how many hours did you spend processing this place? I would suggest uh, over the th three week period, it was roughly 10 to 12 hours a day, not working every day. We did, we did have a couple days off in there. So the pictures that were shown to the jury today, were those all taken in the same day or in different days? They were taken in different days. They were not taken all at the exact same time, no. Now, as far as you being at that home, is this your first time that you were in the Holderson household? In reference to this investigation, yes. I'd never previously had been at that, that residence. So you mentioned multiple times that the way you photographed things that day was how it was when you got there, correct? Correct. Nothing? When, when I, when, from when I entered um, under the guides of the search warrant, uh, we photographed the entire interior of the residence, how we found it. And again, I talked earlier about wearing booties and the cross-contamination. Uh, you, you just cannot get past that but nothing else was, was moved uh, when the initial photographs are taken. Um, and when we, we walk through and we're, we're taking our notes and I talk about that golden hour with uh, Deputy Plenty, uh, we're not moving or touching anything. We are simply looking. And along those lines, would you agree with me that your role is primarily to take in the scene, not necessarily um, analyze the scene. Does that make sense? I would, no, I would disagree because I'm, um, 
My role as, as a crime scene investigator <clears throat> differs from a detective. Um, when I'm at the scene, um, I'm trying to read what the scene is saying. I'm trying to interpret what the scene is saying. The detective, they get verbals. They talk to their, their witnesses, their victims, their suspects, and, and they are able to communicate verbally. I have to interpret what has been left for me. I have to uh, try and essentially analyze, uh, for lack of a better term, um, what is there and what isn't there. So along those lines as well, are you the individual that gets to determine what is of evidentiary value and what is not of evidentiary value? I'm one of the people, yes I am. Um, and I believe in this particular location it would be you and Deputy Plenty. That is correct. Now, and additionally, um, we do our investigation and we're making a uh, evaluation as we're doing it and we're identifying uh, what needs to be done to the scene, okay? That, that first uh, evaluation, what additional resources are we gonna need? Are we gonna need help from other agencies, be it the State Crime Laboratory Field Response, the ATF, DCI's State Fire Marshal's Office, all of that is, is going in and taking place. Um, once we sequence what is going to happen, um, we, we roll out our plan. Now that changes and things happen that allow us to continue and then there's roadblocks that we have to stop um, and, and change our direction, our course of, of, of attack, if you will, on, on processing this scene. Um, once that is all done, again, we talked about that communication with the detectives and having an understanding as to what's taking place outside of the crime scene. I don't know everything that has taken place. I don't know every interview that is being conducted. So what we do then is once we're done with the processing of all of the uh, evidence that we find forensically, we then bring the detectives into the scene and they do a wall-to-wall -wall search. And during that wall-to-wall -wall search, they're looking for additional documents that they might have an understanding that has relevance to the case that I would have no knowledge of because I'm not the one out doing the interviews. This is a team approach and we need the detectives to give us information, we give the detectives information, um, and then we have them come in and we release the scene to the detectives so they can do uh, their wall-to-wall -wall search for additional uh, things that we may have not had any knowledge that may or may not have been important. So in conjunction with you and the crime scene team, along with the detectives, it's fair to say that this house was very thoroughly processed. Yes, I referred to the search when uh, the walkthrough was conducted with the district attorney's office. Um, I used a term um, that when we get done with the search, we're, we're, it's, a, it's gonna, when we're done with a tornado search, we'll find everything. And the district attorney looked at me and wondered what tornado search was. And I told them that we will turn the house upside down looking for whatever piece of evidence is in here that had, would have any value to this case. Um, and that's what we did. And um, the DA has placed all of the exhibits that they've presented to you in that corner. That's not even half of the exhibits or of the evidence that was collected in this case, correct? That is correct. Um, and when we're talking about exhibits and evidence, we're not only talking about anything that could contain blood, um, we're talking about digital evidence such as flash drives, um, anything like that that this house had you would have collected and processed. Yes, ma'am. Now, going into the blood evidence that you, you had talked about in direct examination, you performed two, essentially performed two types of tests, correct? That is correct, yes. And the first one was just to see if there was a presence of blood, is that correct? That is correct, that would be the phenolphthalein test that detects just simply the presence of blood. And then that second one was that hexagon OBDI or OBTI test. That is correct. The hexagon OBTI, that differentiates between 
human blood and non-human blood? The tests that were performed on this blood initially from you, they cannot tell you when that blood was placed on that location, correct? No, they cannot. And I think you might have mentioned this in direct examination, but I'll um, say it again. It cannot tell you, these tests cannot tell you whose blood that is. No, that is what we, that's the screening process that we utilize, again, to get the best probative value for the evidence that we're allowed to submit to the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory. And that's when the DNA uh, evaluation and testing is, is conducted at the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. That is not something that is done in-house by any sheriff's office in Wisconsin. And along those lines, those two tests that you performed on the blood, they cannot tell you um, how it was that the blood was placed there? No, they cannot. Um, same with the physical evidence that you recovered. So, for example, we spent some time talking about metal fragments that were located in the basement. Do you recall those? Yes, I do. Um, now, you're able to determine that they're metal fragments, correct? That is correct. And maybe you're able to determine that they're, I, I think you refer to them as projectiles. Consistent with the lead fragment of a projectile, yes. Um, but a thorough, conclusive saying that this is this metal fragment is a projectile, that's not something that you would be able to do, correct? No, that would again go to a subject matter expert at the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory in the um, firearms section. And again, as far as you're concerned, you cannot tell us when those metal fragments were placed there, correct? No, I cannot. And generally, you cannot tell us how they were placed there. No, I cannot do that either, no. And that goes with any kind of physical evidence that you recovered um, at the household, correct? Could you re ask the question again? Sure, yeah. So I specifically talked about the metal fragments, but yep. as far as any kind of physical evidence that you collected, you weren't able to tell the jury or anyone how it was placed there, correct? In respect to the metal fragments or any evidence? Any evidence. That located. is not correct. So there's some evidence that you are able to say how it was placed there? Correct. Could you give me an example? Uh, the blood stain patterns. Um, and when we're talking about the blood stain patterns, that's quite literally the pattern, not how the blood was placed there, just the pattern, correct? Correct. Well, the pattern will tell us um, uh, basically how it was applied. So when we look at the face of the safe, and we see the stains that are on the face of the safe, um, they're, they're pretty much round um, and, and they're small. And that tells us that those stains impacted on that safe at a 90 or near 90 degree angle. So the face of the safe is a horizontal surface. So the blood is deposited onto the face of the safe at a 90 degree angle. But again, you do not know when it was placed there. I cannot say that, no. I don't have any more questions for you. Thank you. Any redirect? One brief question. Um, the jury previously in council, I think, mentioned um, some of the photos um, the video that Scott Coons, the slow walkthrough of the property, was that done before or after um, photos being taken? I cannot recall exactly the time. It was on the same day, um, uh, but I do not recall if that was prior to or after. Sure. Um, was it done before any items were moved? Nothing was moved. Okay. That's it. May this deputy be excused? And released? Or no? Not released, but excused. Are there any? Uh, well, I know we should get the. Yes, I will I ask will. him to, uh, with your assistance, to box up the uh, exhibits that are there before we proceed to the next witness. Thank you, sir.
Thank you again. Good afternoon, sir. If you are able to safely and responsibly testify without a mask, that would be our preference for the purposes of, the, of witnesses, okay. if you could. Thank you so much. Go right ahead, counsel. Hold on one sec. Nick Stelke, N I C K S T A H L K E. How are you employed? I'm a forensic scientist with the State Crime Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin. And what sort of training did you have to go through to become a forensic scientist? I have to have a minimum of a four year degree or a bachelor's degree. My degree is in medical technology and chemistry. And where did you get that from? St. Cloud State University. And then what, did you have any further training after that? I have a lot of different training sessions that I've attended over the 30 plus years that I've been a forensic scientist. Well, could you give us the highlights? What are some of the specific trainings you have? Well, I had um, training in crime scene response uh, processing. I uh, had a course in advanced scene processing, a uh, blood stain pattern analysis, bullet trajectory, fracture match, uh, or physical match, uh, and all the other associated uh, training that's required for the processing of crime scenes. Okay. And is one of the things that you've had training and experience with Luminol? Yes, it is. And what is Luminol? Luminol is a chemical when uh, added to a scene that has the presence of blood and a uh, hydrogen peroxide will cause uh, a chemiluminescence. Okay, so it's a chemical that when added to blood, it'll cause it to react under a certain light? Yes, it does. Uh, when blood is present and you add uh, lumin luminol, it, the blood... Uh, reacts as a or as a catalyst, causing the uh, blood to actually luminesce or give off light. Okay. And what is it used for? We use utilize luminol for determining whether or not there's a cleanup at a crime scene. I also use, like to use it for determining. Uh, what has actually occurred if there's been any movements within a, a crime scene that isn't necessarily understood from uh, just the visible blood that we see at a scene. So it's helpful in uh, identifying on non-visible blood at a crime scene. So it allows you to see blood that is not able to be seen with the naked eye. That's correct. In the course of this investigation, were you asked to luminol some vehicles? Yes, I was. And was one of those vehicles a Volvo 
um, belonging to a Krista Halderson? It was. And what, if anything, were the results of that luminol? It was negative. And what does that mean? That means that, um, first of all, when we did the examination of that vehicle, we do it always uh, do a visual examination. I did not see any visible blood. We followed that up with then the application of luminol, which again is the, uh, the you see a visible uh, reaction for non-visible blood from the application of luminol, and I did not get a reaction from that. And I'm showing you what has been marked as exhibits 342, 343, and 344. How would you describe exhibits 342 through 344? Exhibits 342, 343, and 344 are uh, photographic images of vehicles that I processed okay. in this case. And I would move 342 through 344 into evidence at this time? No objection. They are received. And I'd ask for the Elmo. And 342. Was this the Volvo that you processed? It is. And no signs of blood in that Volvo? That's correct. And 343. Um, was that the Outback, Subaru Outback vehicle that you processed belonging to Bart Halderson? It was. Okay. Um, and what result did you have with Luminol with that vehicle? Again, it was negative. Okay. And then I'm going to show you 344. Is this another vehicle that you at least took a look at? It is. And did you perform Luminol on this vehicle? I did not. And why is that? The condition of the vehicle, the, all the items that were located within the vehicle would suggest that none of those items had been removed or had been replaced. All those items seemed to be in the condition that um, it had been for some period of time. So we, my, in my estimation, it wasn't necessary to attempt luminol for this particular vehicle. And 344 is specifically the vehicle that was owned by... Uh, Kat Melander, the girlfriend in this case? That was my understanding. Okay. So let me ask you, if I have something that is bloody, but I put it in a plastic, and I put it in some sort of plastic, would luminol detect stains on the flooring underneath? No, if there's no um, contact with luminol on the surface that is being tested with luminol, uh, it will not uh, detect or give any kind of reaction to the uh, application of luminol. So similarly, like putting on gloves, you don't see fingerprints. If you wrap something in a barrier, it would prevent the luminol from picking up on blood. That's correct. And sir, did you uh, write a report in this case? I did. I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 548. Could you please describe Exhibit 548? Yes, Exhibit 548 is a copy of my Confidential Report of Laboratory Findings. And why do you write, write reports with the results from your investigation? We always write reports so that uh, uh, everyone understands that uh, we were there to, uh, pr performing a duty. And uh, uh, those then, when we have conclusions that from our examinations, we, we need to report those to the And to the is agency. exhibit... 348, a true and accurate copy of your report? Exhibit 548. I'm sorry, 548. Yes, it is. All right, I'd move Exhibit 548 into evidence at this time. No objection. It is received. And just for...
completeness. Exhibit 303, is that a copy of your curriculum vitae? Exhibit number 303 is, yes. I would move exhibit 303 into evidence. No objection. It is received. Now, the cars were just a small part of what you looked at in this case. Is that fair? Yes, it was. I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit 304 and exhibit 305. And in connection to this case, you created a PowerPoint. Yes, I was asked to do that, yes. Okay. And exhibit 304 is just the USB of your PowerPoint? And exhibit 305 is a printout of your PowerPoint. Exhibit 305 is that, yes. Okay. I'd move exhibits 304 and 305 into evidence at this time. No objection. They are received. You want to switch it? I think we did. All right. Oh, there we go. So exhibit 305 is a PowerPoint with 23 slides approximately? Yes. Okay. Um, and in the first slide, that's just the outside of the house that you processed? That's correct. And that house is the 4595 Oak Spring Circle address? It was. And what do we see on slide two? I like to describe this house as a tri-level, but it actually has three levels above ground, fourth level being the group, the basement. So this would be the, um, the lowest level. Uh, this is uh, the foyer at the uh, front door. This uh, off to the left is the family room. Behind us would be the entrance to the garage. And through the, in the middle there, in the center, top center of the photograph is the entrance to the basement or the lowest level. Now, did you luminol the entire house? No, we only luminol uh, those areas that of concern. Uh, that in those areas were the basement, the foyer here. There's a bathroom then up on the top right corner of this photograph. We did that one as well. Uh, and then the uh, garage. in the family room, if I didn't mention that. Okay. And slide three. What do you, how would you describe slide three? Slide three is the lowest level. This would be the basement. The basement was split basically in two, um, divided by a dividing wall. This would be the north half of the basement. And how would you describe slide four? Maybe, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I think that's the south, actually the south side of the basement because uh, the, the front door is facing south. So, so this would be, uh, when you go down the basement stairs to the right and, and just to the left, then that is the uh, 
on the north side of the basement, so or the south side of the basement. This is the south side of the basement. This is, then is the floor of the south side of the basement. Slide five. Well, the first, uh, the slide just before this was the, the, a photograph of the floor with white light. Uh, this is uh, the fo a photograph then with a long lens opening with uh, no light at all other than the light that is being uh, uh, generated by the application of luminol and then a small pop of light or flash so that we can get an idea of the uh, relative positions of the items within the scene uh, to the luminol itself. If we didn't do that, you, all you would see would be the luminescence of the of the luminol reacting to the presence of, of whatever it's re reacting to. Now, the blue area that's for lust, I believe you said, is that all blood that it's reacting to? This could be uh, blood that it's reacting to, yes. Exhibit, or slide six. What is the, slide six depicting? Because uh, we only, I uh, only applied small areas of the, the of luminol to the, the basement floor at, in small intervals or in, in sections, uh, this is a second photograph of uh, application of the luminol closer to the, the camera itself. And you said that the luminescence could be blood. Could it be something else? Well, it does lumin luminol does react with uh, bleach uh, or any other chemical that um, uh, has some uh, metals uh, in it. Uh, also, some uh, plant materials will give some false positives. So if somebody had cleaned the floor with bleach, um, that might also respond to your luminol. It can, yes. What about hydrogen peroxide? Would that cause any luminol? Well, um, to cause the reaction of luminol, actually re luminol is part of the uh, chemical reaction of luminol. You, when you apply luminol, you're, re you're applying a solution, a basic solution with luminol and at the, with the addition of hydrogen peroxide which is a, an oxidizer causing the luminol then to react to the iron that's in the hemoglobin of the blood to luminesce. So uh, hydrogen peroxide um, is actually a part of this then. Hydrogen peroxide is also a good cleaning agent or a bleach which will remove stains and break down cellular material like uh, blood. Slide seven, what is the jury seeing? Okay, slide seven is the opposite direction of the previous slides. Uh, if you were, the previous slides had the camera in the position just, th just this side of that small uh, chest freezer looking our direction. In this case, this photograph is looking the opposite direction. When you are, luminoling this area and the area that we just looked at and you're getting some fluorescence. Um, is anybody else swabbing that area or testing it for blood in any manner? Once I, we identify an area that is reacting, uh, giving us a positive reaction to the application of luminol, we then uh, swab it for, um, swab it to get a sample and then we uh, test it again with phenothaline, which is a presumptive test for the presence of, of blood. And uh, <clears throat> because luminol isn't specific to blood, uh, we need a second test to determine if there is potentially blood uh, present. And so we always follow up any positive luminol areas with a, a test, well, a presumptive test called luminol, uh, phenothaline, excuse me. And did Greg Leatherberry, in this case, perform those tests? I performed the uh, phenothalines. I think Greg may have assisted with that, but he collected all of those samples. Okay. 
And did he perform? Oh, you did the phenophthalene, though. Yes. Okay. And so going back to slide five, did you swab and test any of that slide five? Yes, we did. And did it test positive for blood? It did. Presumptive positive for blood. Sure. Um, And slide six, did you swab or test any of those areas? I did. And did any of those test positive presumptive for blood? It did. Slide eight. Oops, I'm sorry. One to nine. Slide eight. What is the jury viewing in slide eight? Slide eight is um, a, a view across the basement from from south to north. The basement stairs is off to the left. The previous views in uh, the previous slides would have been to our right, looking down the south side of the uh, south half of the basement area. This is looking across from then the south side of the basement to the north side of the basement. And slide nine, what are we viewing in slide nine? Slide nine would be then the north side of the basement. Slide 10. Slide 10 is the north side basement floor. And then slide 11. What is the jury seeing in slide 11? Slide 11 is the north side basement floor after the application of luminol. And did you, after applying luminol and getting some fluoresced areas, were those areas swapped? We did swab some areas in the north side, yes. Um, Did you test them with phenophthalene to see if they tested positive for blood? We did. Uh, In this particular case, I don't recall if any of these were positive for presumptive test presence of blood. Sure, so it might have been bleach or some other cleaning agent. Correct. Slide 12. What is the jury looking at in slide 12? This is the basement floor on the, again, on the north side, but closer to the uh, stairs that leading down the basement or leading up to the foyer. And slide 13. This is the uh, same area, uh, however, with ap- after the application of luminol. And how would you describe these results on slide 13? These gave a very strong reaction to the presence of luminol. Uh, I believe that we also had a, a couple positive reactions to the presumptive tests of phenolphthalein as well. But there were some footwear impressions, apparent footwear impressions in blood in these, this area. Um, and you can see that in this photograph. How would you describe slide 14? Slide 14 then is uh, a view from the north side of the basement uh, toward the stairs leading up to the foyer. And slide 15? 15? Yes. Slide 15 is a image of the family room. Uh, this goes, there's a Fireplace there. These are also some stairs that lead up, lead up to the upper floor. A kitchen in the background there. And the foyer is off to the right. Slide. Oh. 16. 16 and then right there, 16. 16. 16 is the uh, fireplace hearth uh, with a floor uh, in front of that. appeared that... Um, there was doing some construction in this, or renovating in this room. Slide 17, just another view. Yep, just another view of the same thing. And slide 18, how would you describe slide 18 to the jury? Slide 18 uh, is the same view as previous view, 
uh, however, after the application of aluminol. This particular view would indicate there was um, some so solution or a wetting, sur wetting of the surface that had occurred here. You can see that there's um, a little bit of a, a movement in drainage or uh, uh, there's a flow pattern, for instance, um, for lack of better word, terminology here, of that uh, luminescing area. And so possible cleanup as well. And your training and experience with luminol, are you also trained in blood stain, stain pattern or blood splatter analysis? Yes. Um, did any, is there anything you can say about the blood staining um, of the basement area? Well, you can see that there's a couple of very bright stains that are luminescing um, very brightly with blue. Uh, those would be um, stains that are uh, not necessarily diluted uh, with any kind of a, a substance or a liquid. Um, those are, so those are fairly strong stains. Uh, the stains that uh, we could visibly see uh, in this area appeared to be more of a drip or a, a contact transfer. And I'm going to go back a f few slides and ask you about the blood pattern. Is there anything, this slide in the basement, slide 13, is there anything you can say about the blood pattern in that slide? The only thing that... Uh, I. This is a real um, complex um, uh, situation, I'd say, with a, a lot of different things going on. There, these are mostly um, transfers or the, just the contact of um, blood onto a surface. There's also some patterns then that would be consistent with the footwear in blood. There's also and also a drip. Patterns there as well, or and there's some spatter stains off to this off to the side or onto vertical surfaces near this. And I'm gonna go. Back to slide five. Is there anything you can say about the pattern there? These patterns are more general in that and diffuse in that it appears that there's been some wiping or cleanup. Okay. Right, I'm going to go back to, I believe we were at 17. Slide 18 we already talked about. Slide 19. How would you describe slide 19? In slide 19, the, these had some, or we had some uh, visible stains. And the ones that are already marked were ones that um, Deputy Leatherberry had visibly seen and um, marked with, um, with these labels, adhesive labels. And slide 20. 20 is uh, image taken. Uh, after the application of luminol, uh, you can see there that there's many more stains that uh, are visible now uh, due to the application of the luminol. Uh, these stains are very similar in characteristic size and shape as the visible stains that you could see and that were already marked. Are you able to say anything about the pattern of or splatter of these stains? These look like... Um, Stains that um, were drip uh, utilizing um, or that are produced from uh, uh, gravity alone acting upon the bloody source uh, with the blood dripping to, straight to the floor. There were a couple of stains that you can see some movement toward the bottom right uh, that are somewhat smeared. Uh, these could be consistent with swipes or wipes. <coughs> Exhibit 21, a view before you luminaled. This is uh, the foyer. Uh, the front door is off to the left. The, the garage entrance is uh, up toward the top of the photograph. 
and this is from the uh, location at the top of the basement stairs. Slide 22, how would you describe slide 22? Uh, the entrance to the fr front of the house, uh, entrance to the left at the end of that rug, and then the entrance to the garage there at the top with the door open. And finally, slide 23. What slide, do you see in slide 23? Slide 23 is then uh, following the application of luminol. Uh, this, we had a positive reaction to the presence of luminol here, just inside the garage door. And this had a pattern to it. It, it, it had, um, uh, it was a, appeared to be a contact transfer uh, with um, the sh shape of a possible container that may have had blood on the, on the, on the surface of it. Okay. And just like with the vehicles, again, if items such as a plastic tarp um, or other barriers were used, would that prevent you from finding blood with luminol? Well, <clears throat> anything that would prevent blood from contacting a surface, which was then ultimately um, applied or had luminol applied to it, would not indicate or give a, pre a positive reaction to the presence of luminol. And if blood was cleaned up with hydrogen peroxide, would you be able to find any traces of it? Well, in with the uh, luminol, uh, because hydrogen peroxide is part of the formula of the luminol itself, it would not give a, a reaction. It would indicate that cleanup had occurred. Uh, it would be, but however, the hypochlorite or bleach does give a, a does give a positive, a negative positive, excuse me, false positive for the for luminol. Are you familiar with lemon at all as a potential cleaning agent? Well, I've heard of um, uh, lemons possibly being used as cleaning agents. It's lemons have citric acid and. Uh, we're all familiar with vinegar, which is acetic acid. So it's a, we know that acetic acid is a cleaning agent. Uh, it's a mild um, acid uh, used in removal of mineral stains and things like that, or met met metal staining and things on that order, So, um, and mineral deposits. So uh, lemons can be used as a, a cleaning agent. It's also a nice deodorizer. Smells yes. good. Yes, it, it, vinegar does have a sour order to it, whereas um, lemons would not have that. And Analyst Stolke, did you test this last stain, slide 23, um, for blood? Uh, you know, I don't recall. I, if, we, if we collected it, we would have tested it. And since we collected it, I'm pretty sure I would have tested okay. it with phenothaline. Fair enough. And... Um, the chemical compound H2O2, is that the chemical formula for hydrogen peroxide? It is. Okay. I have no further questions. Cross-examination. So I'm a bit confused. You said earlier that it could be blood, whatever is illuminating from the luminol, correct? Correct. And I, I believe the other assumption is that it could be bleach, correct? Correct. So whenever we see something illuminated on that TV or on the, the photographs, it could be bleach, yes? Could be one or the other or both, yes. And the only way you'd be able to do that is by doing that additional testing that you talked about with the phenothaline, correct? That would give us more confidence that it is blood, yes. And I believe you said that um, there were some areas where it, it couldn't be detected if what was being illuminated was, in fact, blood. Is Excuse that correct? Me? Say that again. Sure, yeah. Um, I believe you had mentioned that there were some spots where it was illuminated and you did test 
for the presence of blood, but nothing was located or no further um, testing was done. When we got a positive reaction for luminol, I would go to the area that had the strongest uh, luminescence or fluorescence um, and swab that area. We then uh, conducted a phenothalene, which is a presumptive test for phenothalene or for blood. We had several negative tests, but we also had positive tests for the presence of blood. So there could be a combination of both things going on there. Um, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? Uh, just briefly. Um, and these areas were swabbed and samples were collected in the course of this luminol? It was, yes. And those were later sent to some of your colleagues at the Wisconsin State Crime Lab? It would have been tested later on, yes. All right. Nothing further. May this witness be excused? Yes. Thank Release you so much, sir. my subpoena then as well? Uh, it, is he released from his subpoena? We'll talk, uh, we'll talk later about that, but not for right now. Okay. Not for right now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Jenna, can we approach? Yes. Uh, uh, the processing of, of evidence and presentation will continue tomorrow, um, and I appreciate all of your attentiveness today. Um, we'll run the same schedule tomorrow, so if you can be here and we'll be set to go ourselves at 8.45, we'll get started at that point in time. Um, in the meantime, as you go home from here today and as you, I hope, rest this evening, again, stay away from observing any media reports, having any conversations or discussions or taking any steps yourselves to learn anything further and avoid being in any position where anyone around you is talking about the case or uh, providing you purposely or inadvertently with any information. I appreciate everything today, and I hope you all have a good rest this evening. Brand? All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As you just heard, they are kind of wrapping up here a little bit early on day five of the Chandler Halderson homicide trial. The judge, as always, has strived to get people, uh, get the jury out by five o'clock just about every day, just to make sure they're not, you know, overextended and, and taken so much that they can't handle it. So, uh, sounds like the prosecution might have advised that their next witness would have also been a lengthy one, and since it's about a little after 4.20 uh, here in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, they had just decided to kind of wrap things up for the day. So uh, there, there we are. Uh, I'm here with uh, kind of a recap of everything that you might have missed if you were just jumping in uh, halfway through the afternoon or maybe missed the morning session. So uh, as you just saw, if you were watching, uh, our most recent witness called to the stand was a expert from the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, somebody who specialized in kind of those uh, blood splatter analysis and, and the uh, luminol spraying, so that, that black light basically uh, showing where blood might have been. Uh, so we kind of went through some of the photos that investigators took around that area uh, both uh, before and after they had sprayed the, the luminol to kind of see what the reaction would have been. Uh, so they had basically sprayed it in a few areas of the house. They did it in the family room where that fireplace is. They did it in the garage, the basement, and then also the foyer or the entrance of, of the home. Uh, they also sprayed 
the vehicles of Barton Krista Halderson. So um, as, as you remember, the vehicles were left in the garage, but uh, it turns out after they sprayed both of those vehicles, both Bart's uh, Subaru and Krista's Volvo, they didn't find any blood inside. So, um, you know, that, that might have posed a problem for the prosecution. They, they kind of uh, guessed that maybe if somebody had used, you know, plastic tarps, as had been found um, at one of the scenes or, or something like that. It, it could have prevented the blood from staining the cars, but uh, either way, the um, evidence showed that there was no blood in either Bart or Krista's cars. So that was kind of an interesting revelation. They did also uh, mention the, the red Subaru that's owned by Chandler's girlfriend at the time. Authorities said that they chose not to actually take a closer look at that vehicle. They didn't spray it with the luminol, basically saying because everything inside looked like as it had been, it, it hadn't been disturbed. There was no obvious signs that um, anything would have been shuffled around recently. So that's why they say they did not spray the luminol in um, that vehicle. Um, in terms of what it found, they found uh, plenty of reactions, as, as the experts would say, um, from the luminol. They did qualify it by saying that, you know, it, it could be blood, but also there are false positives, if you want to call it that, for things like bleach or, or other things that might have some sort of heavy metal to it that, that could also end up in a, a glow when you shine that black light on it. Uh, but they did say when they found uh, a prospective uh, piece of blood that they did go over and then they swabbed it and they tested it to find out if it actually was blood. And in quite a few cases that those tests kind of turned up results that indicated it likely was blood. So um, we saw several areas of the basement where there might have been uh, pools of blood or at least bleach used to... Uh, clean up there. Obviously, you know, bleach can be used to clean a bunch of things, not necessarily blood at a crime scene either. So that's kind of the defense's point too, that it's hard to kind of um, say exactly where the blood came from in a lot of these cases. But uh, the expert was also able to testify in blood spl splatter analysis. And when it came to things like the blood found in front of the fireplace, he testified that it was consistent with, with a dripping. So if, if somebody had been holding a, a blood source high, it, it would have been consistent with blood dripping down onto the floor or onto the fireplace surface. Uh, so we, we heard that from that expert as well. Before that, we had several hours of testimony from one of the um, main deputies in this case who basically went and tore up the house room by room to look for any piece of evidence that they could. Uh, I think he even referred to it as a tornado search in a way that they kind of turned the house upside down to see what they could find. And one of the more uh, interesting things that they did find in the basement, uh, hidden behind some insulation, uh, they were kind of tipped off to this. There was a slightly exposed area where they had found um, some basically vape mouthpieces uh, that may have been slightly concealed behind the insulation in an exposed part of a wall in the basement. That kind of prompted deputies then to basically rip up the entire insulation of the basement and see what else they could find. And what they did find were uh, three ammunition magazines uh, that were consistent with the ammo that would have been used for an SKS rifle the same rifle that's sort of in question in this case. They found three magazines. Uh, two of them had 20 rounds of ammo in them each. The third only had 15 rounds of ammo. So sort of the implication there being that somewhere there were five spent casings and they did find a shell casing sort of uh, rolled under a workbench in the basement and investigators testified that the shell casing that they found was consistent with the ammo that was found in the magazines. It was also consistent with a bullet that uh, Chandler Halderson had given to his brother as a get well gift, Mitchell, um, his brother Mitchell, who of course went 
into the hospital with a diabetes diagnosis uh, a few weeks before all of this is said to have happened. Uh, Mitchell testified that Chandler gave him a bullet that said get well soon on it. it it's basically a, a, a gift. It sounds weird to some people, but uh, Mitchell said that he, he it was the connection was those two played video games together frequently, uh, played first person shooter games and so the the bullet was sort of a nod to uh, their brotherly bond of, of playing video games to each other. But uh, we learned today that investigators found that bullet matched the shell casing that was found in the basement as well as the uh, ammunition that was found in the magazines hidden behind the wall, uh, clearly hidden. Uh, as if somebody didn't want that to be found. So investigators thought that was of note as well. Um, we also saw further uh, digging into areas of that basement too. As we mentioned before the break, they had a freezer that they were looking at that uh, was empty inside, looked like it had been pretty thoroughly cleaned, but when they did a swab for uh a blood test they came back and found that human blood had been in the drain of that freezer as well um, they also found bullet fragments in addition to that shell casing in that basement as well and um, blood splatter on a safe that was on the floor of the basement uh, in cross-examination the defense had kind of questioned the deputy on whether he could tell when any of this blood came, right? Because it's one thing to find blood, but if you can't say where it came from, and it, it, it's hard to um, kind of pinpoint that, but he was able to testify that they may not be able to know when the blood splatter happened, but it was uh, pretty consistent with um, a perpendicular motion. Like the, the blood splatter came at that safe had at a 90 degree angle that safe is sitting on the floor so the implication being that something would have had to been on the floor to create that splatter as well um so lots of blood analysis as as i think we probably anticipated in this case uh today was really heavy on the evidence as as we mentioned earlier today in these recaps you know in the first days of the trial we had some pretty lengthy uh testimony where people gave some pretty emotional accounts of, of what they remember in those days. Today, it, it was more data and evidence driven. Uh, the jury got to see a ton of actual physical pieces of evidence, whether it was those shell casings, the magazines. Uh, they found an ax in the garage that had blood stains on the handle and on the ax head. They got to see that pulled out in front of them too, and, and they got to see that shown up close. Uh, they got to see pieces of rope that were found in the garage that were cut off, that were consistent with a piece of rope that was found around the body of Bart Halderson. They found rolls of duct tape that were in both scenes, both inside the Halderson house and uh, inside a garbage bin that was disposed of at the Cottage Grove farm. So. Uh, almost too much to to count here. I, I assure you, my notes for today are about a mile long. That's there's a lot of pieces of evidence in this case, and prosecutors are still just in day five of their case. They anticipate this to go much longer. Um, if you're just joining us or or haven't been following along, prosecutors say their case could stretch into a third week. So we're just getting underway with week two here. So there could be a full week more of of things like this as we look ahead. Um, definitely lots to look into. And if you miss anything at all, we're going to have it all recapped on our website. That's channel3000.com. You can go there and click that banner at the top of the page for this trial, and you'll get more information there as well. You can also just go to channel3000.com slash Holderson. That's the direct link. It's in the description of these videos if you're watching uh, either live or if you're watching back at the end of the day. I know a lot of people um, I've heard from say they'll go back and, and watch this to kind of catch up on things that they missed during the day while they're at work or, or what have you. Um, if you go into the description there, there's a link for our Halderson trial page there as well. That's where you're going to find all the recaps, everything that happened every day, these live stream videos, basically 
every story we've ever done on this case is also archived on that page. So go there and you'll be up to speed in no time. Uh, in the meantime, as we mentioned, uh, court wrapped up a little bit early today, but they'll be back uh, at their normal time tomorrow, they've typically been starting at about 8.45 or so, and that's, I think, when we can expect to start day six tomorrow. So uh, be on the lookout for that. We'll be here. We'll live stream all of these days, everything. Uh, you're not going to miss anything, so be back here tomorrow morning. And like I said, channel3000.com is where you can go to catch up or watch these live every day. Uh, with that said, we're going to get to work on, on recapping all of this too, everything I just said here over on the website. Uh, and be sure to watch our newscasts on air as well. News 3 Now at 5 and 6 still coming up here in Madison. If you're in southern Wisconsin, tune in and we'll have a full recap there as well. Uh, with, with that said, for now we're going to wrap things up here. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for watching and we'll, we will continue to recap everything as it happens uh, in the days to come. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow morning.